call the Wednesday, August 19th meeting of the Community Budget Advisory Committee to order. The first order of business on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Do I hear a motion? <coughs> so moved. It's been moved and Second. seconded uh, that the agenda be approved. Any discussion? And one thing you'll note is that I did assign time slots to items tonight because we have several presentations. Some of them look long and I wanted to make sure that we set expectations on what times were. Um, just for folks that, who might be watching in the public, those times are estimated starting times, so we're not going to wait if a particular agenda item gets done earlier. We're gonna move on to the next one. <clears throat> folks can catch up by watching the, the replay on YouTube if they miss part of the, part of the meeting. Um, so with that, any other discussion on the agenda? Uh, we'll come to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion carries. Next up is the approval of the minutes. From Do I hear a motion regarding the approval of the minutes? So move. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that the minutes be approved. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll come to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion carries. Uh, onward then to section four, and we'll start with the information and updates. Kari Carlson. <clears throat> yes, thank you, and good evening, uh, chairs and committee members. And what I have is our follow-up from our last meeting, some information and updates. Um, always bring up this slide with our deliverables. Uh, we're on track. And uh, the first thing was some follow-up about the analysis, analysis that's been going in to the lodging and emission tax forecasts that we're looking at for 2021 with, if you recall, those worst case, moderate case, best case uh, scenarios for revenues of lodging and emission taxes. And uh, there's a lot of information on here. I won't read through it all, but um, just wanted to point out that the sources that we're using, um, this was some information from our Port, uh, Port Authority Administrator, Shane Rudling. Um, so he is leading our work group that's meeting weekly from people from um, the Port Authority assessing and finance to anal analyze industry information. And um, so there's national forecast data and it's compiled from Smith Travel Research, Green Street, CBRE, um, LARC, and HVS, along with uh, news articles and local information. Um, the Bloomington Visitors and Convention Bureau is using our moderate <coughs> forecast um, for their information. So uh, we, we're in discussions with them. Um, and the Smith Travel Research Report, it's, it's a local analysis of, the, of Bloomington's 47 hotels. And then just to point out as well um, that what we've been forecasting has been fairly accurate to date um, so far. And that as we get every month, we're collecting these admissions. These are local taxes that we collect here in Bloomington. So we know right away um, how the revenues are coming in. So we have real-time updates on collections. So, and some validation of prior projections. And that the, we were talking about last week, the REVPAR, the revenue per available room. So um, it's been rising over the summer months and we expect it to kind of moderate in the fall and winter um, compared to our baseline 2019 revenues. Um, so there's some information, just more on the, that forecast um, that um, Maureen was asking last week. And then um, when we talked about the engagement plan, I think it was Jessica that asked about how we could add youth to, um, we're having these community partner conversations. We just had one yesterday, it was our first one with the Latino leaders um, group. And um, we're scheduling some more, more of those. We didn't specifically have a youth one. So we can look, these are just some different options maybe to think about how you'd like us to proceed. We can schedule an additional listening session with youth. Uh, we could invite, and then just encourage the youth to participate in the, the overall community listing sessions that we have in September and October and get that information out to the school district and encourage um, parents of you know children as well as youth to um, participate. Um, and then we can do a, a target push for youth to participate in that Let's Talk Bloomington website page that's gonna be going live fairly soon. And so maybe like after school starts, um, we might uh, we might be, be able to do that. So um, just looking if there was a specific group that you had in mind, or if you think if we just have that information and advertising uh, to the school district about different opportunities to participate. 
Mr. Chair, uh, Kerry, I think what I was wondering is the youth have a different way of talking. Mm -hmm. They they relate to it, it's just different. <laughs> so I I think the number three will <coughs> go more towards that you know uniqueness of them talking between them or somebody youth that can connect them because. Truly, my experience is through Girl Scouts and to different things that I see. They, they have a way to communicate that I, I sometimes don't, don't get it. So just, just pointing that out. But I think number two, three will be uh, something that I think is appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Um, another question was um, more detail regarding how the information will be shared. So the staff, our engagement staff, um, we'll be working with them too. We will, when we have all of this um, information collected, we will provide an overview of who participated. Um, we have, we're going to be doing some polling on demographics, like um, age, race, ethnicity, zip code, um, they own or rent. It'll be optional, but whatever information we have, we can put that together um, with a breakdown and summary for all the sessions. And then as far as measuring the success, um, it's, you know, the, per the perspective of the community outreach um, is, is how well we're able to connect with the public and a goal of reaching a large cross-section of Bloomington residents and ensuring that voices are heard, especially those that don't typically engage with local government, which is why we're starting out with these targeted um, community partner listening sessions. So we hope to reach out um, to those groups specifically. And uh, for me measuring success, it's going to be um, in these different categories. I won't read through all the details, but just um, that, that there's stakeholder satisf satisfaction, um, that the process and quality of the work um, that we are um, doing these sessions, um, how we have them planned, and that they're well executed and well executed and on time, and that there's that the engagement opportunities are well advertised and messaged and uh, well attended. And that um, that we incorporate equity and inclusion into all these engagement sessions. Um, so that's uh, some follow up on the engagement plan. And then just here, I've kind of added a little bit um, as this next item that was added recently to the agenda about the preliminary tax levy discussion. So just here's some information that you can kind of use for that discussion. So uh, this is showing at the top is the 2020. The this is the median value home. And um, for the city tax portion for 2020, the annual tax is a million, I'm sorry, it's not a million, it's $1,076.79 annually for the median value home. And that was a 4.75% tax increase from the previous year. And that monthly um, cost is $89.73 per month. And below are we're talking about different potential um, tax increases. So if the tax levy was not increased at all, and um, for the median value home, the tax would actually go down slightly. It would go down by $1.21 per month. If it's a 1% increase, it um, goes down 26 cents per month. A 2% increase is 69 cents per month and so forth. And the number that we, uh, or that the committee was talking about last week was the $60 a year uh, increase, which is a $5 per month increase for the median value home. And then um, this is, these are examples of different residential districts within the city, just to highlight that, you know, the median value home was one way of looking at it. That's the home that's, you know, the value that's right in the middle. Um, but then depending on the value of the home and where it is and how the values change from 2020, um, this is, these are some examples. So for this one, this is in District 1 in Glen Wilding. And um, for this home, that's valued at 335700 a 6.44% tax increase would be $9.10 or else, you know, lower as you go down. <coughs> Here's an example in District 2, um, just showing what that um, 
0.44% tax increase would be. So this home was valued at 363500 but since the value went down from the previous year, um, it's lower impact. Um, so a 6.44% increase would be $2.58 a month for a home at this value. Um, and then District 3, this is a home of $489,300. Um, that's increasing to $498,100 for 2021. And a 6.44% increase for this home, that it's located in the Norman Ridge Residential District, would be $12.94 per month increase. And then this last one I have as an example is in Running Park. The home value is 248300 is increasing to 251900 for the median value home in this district. And at 6.44%, that would be $4.83 a month increase. Or at, you know, like 1%, that would be $0.38 cents per month. Um, and then the, this slide is showing, we talk about the impact on renters. So... Um, potential impact on renters. So for multifamily um, properties like apartments, the uh, an increase in property tax could affect the rent that they charge for their renters. So on this slide, at the top is the median value home that we were just looking at. And we're just we're showing that if it was an increase of sixty dollars annually or five dollars monthly, um, so that would be 6.44% tax increase. That's how the median value home is affected. And then there's, these are different um, multifamily uh, apartment buildings. And Applewood Point is an example of like a senior housing. And a 6.44% tax levy increase would be a annual change of $105.37 or a monthly increase of $8.78. Um, indigo would represent a market rate multifamily um, apartment building, and for that it would be six dollars and thirty six sorry six dollars and thirty six cents per month increase. And then uh, South Point is a, a multifamily property that would represent naturally occurring affordable housing, and that would be a monthly increase. I'm sorry. Um, the monthly amount, it wouldn't be an increase, but the monthly amount would increase from $44.47 to $48.84. So a $4.37 increase per month. And so then the last slide, I just brought this up, if you want it as a reference, about this was what we looked at last week. And this was showing... Um, Potential increases in the tax levy from zero up to 7% along the top. And then on the left was kind of the worst case scenario with our lodging and admission tax revenues. And then a moderate case and a best case scenario. We were kind of focusing in on the, I think, worst case is what the committee was looking at. Um, but just to highlight, so... What this is showing is how much, how many, uh, how much of the budget expenses we would have to reduce in order to hit this tax levy. So if we had a zero percent increase, and we're looking at a worst case scenario, we need to um, reduce or eliminate four point nine million dollars. Um, so that's all I had for information updates. If there's any questions of anything I went over, or if you want to use this information to continue on. I think that that's actually a really great segue into the 4.2 item, which is the preliminary levy discussion. So setting aside the preliminary levy discussion for, for a moment, <clears throat> were there questions on any other part of the presentation so we can kind of check that off and dive into the preliminary levy again? I have not seen any hands waving up in the air. Um, so just a couple of things to kind of frame this up. We had said at the last meeting that um, that we felt like we had a consensus, but if folks had a feeling that they wanted to have additional conversation that they could bring that forward and we would bring it back to the meeting. That happened, so that's why it's back at the meeting. <clears throat> um, just a little bit of context around this. Number one is the preliminary levy, the number that we pick serves two functions. One is it sets a maximum for the amount of levy that we can go for the year. And the other thing that the preliminary levy does is it sets the number that goes out in the truth and taxation, taxation statement that goes out in November to every taxpayer. <clears throat> so effectively what we're doing is we're 
we're setting kind of a high estimate of what that number would be that would go to people to get their reaction as part of the truth and taxation process. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is that um, that the the discussion tonight is really the last discussion that we're going to have on the preliminary levy. So we need to exit the meeting and say we've put that that question completely to bed. So within that context, um, I will open the floor up to conversation on the preliminary levy. Um, as if you could go back, maybe have like five slides. Um, yeah, the one that's before the District 1 one, um, just for purposes of conversation, because I think this is this is really the question that we're talking about here. <clears throat> we selected the lower right-hand corner option there, which was the $60 a year number at the last meeting. And so just as a starting point for the conversation, that's kind of where we're at from a consensus perspective. So I'll open it up now. Jessica. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, what what my question was it is um, related to okay we increase on the six point five percent is the school board is gonna increase what others as I review my my statement and, and I, it's just more for educational purpose as well I see different items so mm -hmm. the person who received the property taxes what will be the maximum that they will see, right? Yeah, that's a good Depending question. And I, may, I, may call the lines. The, I may call on the staff in a second to answer that. But in general, there's a bunch of processes like this that are going in parallel. Mm -hmm. So Commissioner Gibbs, for example, is involved in the park system. And I'm assuming you're having similar conversations like this related to parks, which is kind of down in the other taxing district section of the of the document there. But... <clears throat> The county is having conversations about theirs, and the the school that the school board is also having a conversation about theirs. We won't know their answers um, in time for it to make a meaningful their their final answers in time for it to make a meaningful impact on what we're doing. We'll probably have some preliminary information about it, but they'll be in the same position with respect to us as we are to them, and that they they would look to the city and say, "Well, what are you going to do?" And we're kind of like, "Well, we're still deciding," and they're kind of they're in that same state. So. Um, Kari or Jamie, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that, or maybe some information that uh, additional information that we could talk about tonight. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair <clears throat> Peterson, committee members. Uh, I did have a conversation with Commissioner Gattel and asked her specifically uh, about the county's um, likely direction, <clears throat> and what she shared with me was they were um, looking at a zero percent tax levy. Uh, I did ask her if that was going to be. The preliminary levy as well and she thought the preliminary levy was probably going to be a little bit higher again sort of the same point that we've made just to provide some flexibility there um, but what she specifically said to me is that was their target uh, i also talked to the school district and their number won't really be known until we get until they get information from the minnesota department of education on on what their funding formula is uh, for the coming year and at that time, they will uh, touch base with us because they actually work with our staff to identify what that impact number is. Um, but based on my understanding, it's probably a number, a number uh, similar to what we're talking about here for our preliminary levy. Um, so they track very closely uh, in terms of the uh, percentage of the uh, property tax collection uh, as the city. So um, in, if, it's, if it's somewhere in the same ballpark as, as what we're looking at, uh, that makes the math pretty easy, but I don't want to say that out loud because I don't have good information from them just yet. Thank you. Did I answer your question? Yeah, a lot, a lot better. I feel a lot better now. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Maureen. Uh, thank you, Co-Chair Peterson. Um, so... We as a group decided or discussed last week, we were uh, all in agreement on the worst case scenario for the lodging tax, admission tax is my understanding. And now the Convention and Visitors Bureau, who really is the one that has the thumb on everything and in, in the industry is saying that they feel they're gonna be in that moderate case in between you know, the good and, so I, I guess with that, I tend to um, 
lean in to the experts in that industry. And if the Convention and Visitors Bureau is feeling pretty optimistic that they're going to be in the middle, then that would change, for me, the discussion on the preliminary levy because we based it on that worst case scenario. And if you look at those two, there, there is a difference. So I just wanted to bring that up uh, to the group. If, if the industry say, no, we think we're, it's gonna be moderate and we're thinking the worst case scenario, um, I think that makes me wanna pause on the 6.5% that we discussed last week, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. And I'm wondering if the staff has any information on kind of what the Convention Bureau has as their source for information. Um, Co-chairs, uh, uh, Marine and committee members, the, uh, the CVB is using data that's very similar to ours, especially the Smith Travel. Um, so we're, we're looking at much of the same information. And then uh, we also get to see uh, through the uh, lodging tax uh, remittance uh, what the what the numbers are at each of the hotels so on a month-to-month -month basis we actually get the first look at that in that data before the CVB does because what happens is we take in the money and then we transmit it to the CVB so the numbers are actually coming to us that we can figure out um, <clears throat> in terms of the revenue. That doesn't answer the Rev Park questions. That's where they rely on uh, Smith Travel and some others. I would tend to agree with you in terms of the scenario, but I don't think it's necessary at this point for the committee to get locked in on which scenario you want to use for options. Um, I think it's informative. Kari, can you go to the slide that has the three different uh, scenarios outlined? I think it's helpful just to give the committee a sense of where you might go with your options, and it's certainly helpful to uh, identify what our starting point is. Um, the The worst case scenario is um, determined in addition to the data that Kari outlined that our, our forecasting team is using. We're also envisioning in there certain... Um, real-world events. In other words, the worst-case scenario assumes a second round of business closures later this year because the, the um, pandemic is not under control. Uh, it assumes that schools are not back to a normal operating before next fall. It assumes that a vaccine is not in mass production and there, there's not mass inoculation occurring before the end of next year. Okay. So those are some pretty drastic um, scenario assumptions. Uh, I think the, the moderate case assumptions are tracking more with where we're currently at based on the scientific data, what we understand to be the, the development of uh, vaccinations. Um, in fact, on the data, um, what the staff has shared with me is that we're actually about 11% gloomier on our moderate case scenario than what the actual uh, data is in the industry. And that's because we're, we're tweaking it for certain local assumptions having to do with the, the prevalence of tourism and hospitality in our local economy. Uh, so, you know, I, sitting here today, I feel pretty good about that moderate case, and I also recognize that things can change pretty quickly, right? And so uh, I, I think that we're okay with the committee um, not having to choose uh, which assumption you want to use until uh, maybe another month from now as we start to narrow mm -hmm. in on it. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Um, I, would, I would caution a little bit. I mean, we have as a city, I mean, this panel, have a lot more skin in the game than the Convention Bureau. I have great admiration for them. They run a marvelous organization. Bonnie has done a great job. But their budget is, what, $6 million or $7 million, and if they have to react very quickly, if the number is wrong, they cut out some travel and cut out some convention stuff. We're different here. We've got to plow streets. We've got to... We've got to have our fire department and our police department on the street, and we don't have a lot of way to back down if we took the moderate and it didn't work. 
So it's the old adage, we you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So we, we have to help lead that discussion, I think. So I'd be careful about yeah, Chair Peterson, I, I think that's a good point. And I do want to share one little bit of information here with the committee um, because we have to make some working assumptions for staff to start <clears throat> preparing for what the committee will see over the next couple months from the departments. Uh, so I did um, uh, work with uh, Kari and Chris and Lori uh, to put together uh, a target for reduction overall and then segmented that by the departments, and we uh, met with the department directors yesterday to walk through that. So the target that I uh, gave them was a $3.7 million uh, reduction. And so if you look here, you can see either in the moderate case or the worst case where that would come in from a levy perspective. Okay, uh, <clears throat> So that's, that's our starting point. That's what departments are going to be working towards when they come back in after their first meeting with you. They'll be, the, the second visit with you will be sharing how they're reaching their departmental targets. And uh, they, they understand the approach and suggestion from the committee that they actually overshoot the target just to provide options. And so when we come back uh, to have that conversation late in September and early October, starting to put together the options, what we'll be doing is bundling those into three different scenarios based on what the committee says they want to do here on the scenario assumptions uh, so that you have essentially the menu that you can choose from on, on what's being offered by the departments. But for the time being, um, we went back to what the council was thinking four months ago uh, in terms of that 0% is sort of the worst case um, scenario and using the moderate case assumption that's how we ended on the 3.7 million yeah so the other i was just looking here because having been on the cbd's board i can go back and look at my email and actually look at the budget from previously and you know like looking at last year's budget four sixths of the budget was on sales and marketing which would be a variable expense mm -hmm. um and so um their their ability, I think they have more ability to take risk mm -hmm. in their budget than we do in our budget. And I think that was the point that Neil was making in a little bit different way than what I am. But um, I think uh, there's a set of services that people expect us to deliver. And um, when a number gets picked for kind of the revenue and the expense side, we end up having to kind of follow through on that. And there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of scope to adapt easily. Whereas in, in their budget, there's that sales and marketing thing, which is a knob that is very easy for them to turn. You know, just to give you an idea, there's like a million dollars worth of like fulfillment and printing in there. So there's substantial numbers like that that are really easy to change if, the, if they took a risk and it didn't uh, turn out to be the case. Other questions or comments? Tom. Yeah, uh, Chair Peterson, um, thank you. Um, I wasn't here last week, but uh, I reviewed uh, the notes. Uh, I reviewed the the conversations that you had last week, and I think 6.44 is a good conservative number that gives us flexibility um, to begin with, with the, the data and the information that we have currently. Because even in the last two, three days, we've seen significant changes. Like Notre Dame just canceled all their in-person classes because they had a... COVID outbreak there. So I think with what we know currently, um, being a little more conservative, having flexibility gives us the uh, more options um, with the unknown in the future. Uh, so I, I think that was a, a good number and it's something I definitely think um, we we would be good to set at uh, to to begin the, our, our additional conversations. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to ask... Um, is there anybody who wants to push heavily for moving away from that $60 number that we've been talking about at this point? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody waving the flag here, so I'm going to say that we're sticking with the $60 number as the preliminary levy and whatever that backs into as the percentage. Okay. Um, that's it on item 4.2 then. So next we'll go on to item number 4.3, which is the Parks and Recreation Department presentation. Hi, everyone. Yeah. My name is Ann Catry. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Bloomington. I have been in Bloomington since January of 2019. And prior to that, I was the Parks and Recreation Director for the City of Edina. 
I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you uh, this evening, and I look forward to uh, giving you a high-level overview of what we do in the Parks and Recreation Department. First off, I would like to give a, a quick apology for the presentation that went out in the packet. It was incomplete. You should have received the, uh, the full presentation today. We're not quite sure what happened, but there was some sort of a saving error, and about 15 of my slides weren't included in the packet that went out over the weekend. So my apologies to you uh, for that. <laughs> The city of Bloomington Anne, before has... You, Anne, before you go any further, yes. I'm over, over here, Jamie. <laughs> if you want to take your mask off, since you're going to be talking for the next 45 minutes or so, if you want to be more comfortable. Yeah, there that you go. That sounds great. I'm yeah. already starting to hyperventilate. <laughs> I, know, I thought as much. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. The city of Bloomington has 97 parks and almost 9,000 acres of parkland and open spaces. That's approximately 39% of the land area in Bloomington. It's pretty obvious how important parks and open spaces are to the residents of Bloomington. The city owns and manages approximately 3,000 of those acres of parkland. The remainder of the parks and open space areas are operated by tremendous partners in the Three Rivers Park District and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I have three of my amazing uh, directors and, and leaders in my department joining us on the call this evening. Uh, first of all, I have Susan Foss, who is our deputy director. Susan oversees our recreation facilities, including Creekside, the Bloomington Center for the Arts, the Bloomington Ice Garden, and our golf courses. I also have Renee Clark, our assistant director of Parks and Projects, um, on the, the call with us today, Renee oversees our work with regional parks, the Met Council, capital planning, and park planning. And also joining us this evening is Allison Warren. Allison is our recreation manager. She oversees our recreation supervisors, including athletics, youth, family and inclusion, special events, our history programs, and aquatics. It's uh, worth noting that prior to 2019, Parks and Recreation was a division of community services. So just since uh, the beginning of 2019, Parks and Recreation is a department. This slide illustrates our typical staffing levels in 2019 and the impact COVID had in 2020. We're down over 200 part-time employees and three full-time employees. Three things to point out regarding our full-time staff changes in 2020. We had one retirement at Highland Greens in the fall of 2019. We did not fill that position. We had one full-time golf maintenance layoff due to Highland Greens not opening this year. And we lost one full-time recreation coordinator from Creekside, also because Creekside didn't open in 2020 or closed in 2020 due to COVID. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the recreation programs typically offered through the Parks and Recreation Department. And I say typically because this year is not a typical year and we're not running uh, most um, of our programs. You're all familiar with Summer Fet. One of my most frequently asked questions uh, by residents in Bloomington is how much do the fireworks cost? In 2019, the fireworks cost $42,000. We received almost $20,000 in donations. We received $12,000 from the Met Council Operations and Maintenance Funding, uh, leaving the cost of the city for fireworks for $10,000. It's one of the most uh, storied and popular traditions in the city of Bloomington. Pond Dakota Mission Park is the site of the historic Oak Grove Mission and the 1856 Gideon and Agnes Pond House. The Gideon Pond House is owned and was renovated by the city, is the oldest site in Bloomington, is on the National Register, and hosts free events and house tours every Sunday. At this site annually, we host River Rendezvous, the largest purely educational living history event in Minnesota. This popular field trip for elementary and middle school students attracts kids from 70 schools from around the metro. Our Arts in the Park program is a very large program for the city of Bloomington as well. We offer a wide variety of concerts, movies, and performances around the city. We also host many special event rentals, 5Ks, and we do our own special events as well. We offer a large farmer's market on Saturdays from June until October. 
We also offer Wednesday midweek markets and four winter markets as well. And we currently have three community garden sites with 178 plots, and we're currently looking to expand to another site next year. Our plots have been full for the last several years. For outdoor skating rinks, we have 28 rinks at 13 sites and host an estimated 6,500 skaters annually. We staff four sites and use volunteers to open warming houses at the other nine sites. Westwood and Running Parks are our busiest skating facilities. The downside to our skating rinks is that skating facilities are very expensive to maintain and have a short season, typically only eight to nine weeks. If we're lucky, we open in mid-December and typically we're closing by President's Day and that's really uh, determined by the weather. We offer several very popular youth programs during the summer. Camp Coda, the Summer Adventure Playgrounds, and the View and Mini View fill up almost instantly when programs open up in the spring. We could offer more programs if we had the space, but we do have a, a significant limitation to indoor programming space. We're also seeing a growing need for fee assistance, and currently these fee assistance expenses are absorbed into our annual operating budgets. We also offer adaptive and inclusion services, offering many programs and events for our residents with disabilities. We also partly partner in Arley with Richfield, Eden Prairie, and Edina in offering those services. Arley stands for Adaptive Recreation Learning Exchange, and some of the programs offered through this collaboration include softball, bowling, water aerobics, fitness programs, skiing and snowboarding, golf, as well as a number of social programs for youth and adults. Some classes that are offered include cooking, independent living skills, theater and performing arts, health, fitness, and other leisure learning activities. We offer volunteer and community outreach programs and solicit and place volunteers for our summer programs, the Bloomington Center for the Arts, special events, adaptive recreation programs, and also park cleanup events. We have a large adult sports program. As you can see, we offer a wide variety of traditional adult sports and some newer types of activities like sp spike ball and beanbag leagues. In 2018, we had 468 teams participating, and in 2019, we had 477 teams participating in those adult sports. For youth sports, we provide scheduling and athletic field services for Bloomington Athletic Associations. We're working to improve how we schedule fields to be more efficient, hold our athletic associations more accountable for the fields that they reserve, and also to save resources. It's worth noting that we currently do not charge any fees for any youth sports field utilization. That is very unusual. 100% of the cost to maintain these fields is charged back to our budget from the Park Maintenance Division. The Galaxy program is a school district after school program. Galaxy is updating its program to include middle school sports moving forward. The city currently provides $133,000 in support to the school district to run the Galaxy program. The city has also historically provided $35,000 in inclusion services as well as access to the Bloomington Family Aquatic Center for Galaxy participants at no cost. Over the past year, we have been in discussions with the school district about eliminating our inclusion service support for $35,000, and we did eliminate this from our budget request in 2021. The Armory. The city is lacking indoor gym space, so we lease space from the Armory, mostly for adult sports. Pickleball, as you know, is a very popular sport for people of all ages, and it's a very popular program offered through the Armory. Creekside Community Center. Creekside is a community center of 25,000 square feet built in 1960. The facility is outdated 
and most mechanical, plumbing, electrical, and building envelope systems are in need of replacement or repair. In 2019, Creekside had 40,000 visits from 2,280 individuals participating in activities, programs, and rentals. Creekside has offered many services, including public health services, food services, and tax assistance. Creekside also offers 30 senior-led programs, everything from arts and crafts, music, fitness, and recreation. It's worth noting that 95% of the participants at Creekside are Bloomington residents. In March, we were forced to close Creekside due to COVID-19. Because of the budget crisis caused by COVID, in April and May, we made some difficult recommendations to the City Council to temporarily or possibly close Creekside permanently. Two options proposed to the Council were moving senior programming to the Bloomington Center for the Arts, and the second was reopening Creekside with limited programming. At the time, the Council decided to close Creekside through 2020 out of concern for COVID and social distancing, and a decision on operations of Creekside in 2021 has not been made. In summary, all of the programs that I reviewed um, in 2020 to 2021 um, have a 3.6 expense decrease with revenue increasing by 0.6. Overall, a 4.2% decline is proposed. This also shows, um, if you see the park maintenance line, the chargeback to the park maintenance services to the recreation budget of $5.8 million. Park grants. Uh, we receive between $250,000 and $500,000 annually from the Met Council and state bonding money for regional park improvements. Some examples of projects are the Normandale Lake Banshell, parking lot renovations, and the upcoming Normandale Lake restroom and maintenance building replacement. The Bloomington Family Aquatic Center is almost 50 years old and is also in need of replacement. We hope to do an evaluation of the pool vessel this year to determine how many more years we can reasonably expect to get out of the shell. Currently, we are planning to uh, replace the pool shell in 2026. This is a popular amenity for residents with some of the lower admission and season pass rates in the metro. Daily rates are $8 to $10, but season passes cost $23 for children and seniors, $34 for kids ages 11 to 15, and $62 for a season for people ages 16 to 54. Obviously, the Aquatic Center is a very weather-dependent facility, but we average around 50,000 annual visits. Bush Lake Beach is one of Bloomington's most treasured amenities. We see well over 50,000 annual visits at Bush Lake. In addition to the beach, we have a playground, picnic shelters, and canoe racks. Our aquatic budget, my marker, oh, there we go. Um, our aquatic budget, as you can see, the property tax support for the aquatic center and Bush Lake Beach total is $563,000. On a side note, we're currently doing a survey of users at Bush Lake Beach to determine how valuable lifeguards are to the experience at Bush Lake Beach. That survey just closed last week, and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, tabulating and, uh, and um, getting into those results. Obviously, lifeguards are a tremendous expense um, at the beach, and it's becoming increasingly more difficult to, uh, to operate um, and to find those lifeguards. Uh, we currently have been operating Bush Lake Beach without lifeguards this season after we decided to, uh, to reopen the beach after a, a, a slow opening. Um, I believe we opened it sometime in July. 
So the, uh, the long-term model for the Aquatics Fund has a reduced property tax levy in 2021 to 2025 compared to previous years based on the recommendation from this committee to stop levying an amount of around $650,000 to transfer to the facility fund to build a working capital for a future pool vessel replacement. When it comes time to replace the pool vessel, debt will be issued instead. The working capital balance in the model looks good until 2024 when planned capital projects will reduce the balance below the goals for the fund. Getting into golf. Duan is a very popular course in the metro. It's a prime metro location with an affordable rate structure. It's a shorter course with tees ranging from 3,300 to 5,500 yards. It's an ideal course for an aging demographic and retiring baby, bo baby boomers because of the size and the level terrain. The shorter golf course also allows for a faster pace of play in an ever challenging time for um, people's time. Uh, the, the faster pace of play is definitely a bonus for, uh, for Duan. Duan is also a certified Audubon sanctuary. In 2020, rounds are up significantly over the same time last year, and barring any COVID shutdowns or any severe weather impacts, Duan is on pace to have its best year ever since 2010. <laughs> Duan averaged 38,000 rounds in the last five years and 39,000 rounds in the last 10 years. Duan is also the host site for Bloomington Kennedy and Jefferson High School boys and girls golf teams. Duan has a very large men's club and three very strong women's leagues, and we also host a variety of other leagues throughout the week. Duan is another facility that's 50 years old and has uh, some very significant need for reinvestment. The clubhouse is in poor condition and is very outdated. The parking lot is inefficient, and some of the features on the golf course also need renovation. Staff recommends completing a study of the golf course and facilities to determine how to properly invest in the facility and how we can best provide for return on investment. Highland Greens is a popular nine-hole executive course for seniors, juniors, and families. Highland has six par three holes and three par four holes. The yardages range from 1,100 to 1,500 yards. Highland hosts many leagues, the BAA Junior Golf Program, and a lesson program with which we currently contract out with an outside vendor. Highland Greens also has a nine-hole foot golf course. For those of you that don't know, foot golf is kind of a combination of golf and soccer. And uh, this course is on the old driving range site along Normandale Boulevard. Highland also has a strong lesson program and it's a great place for kids to get interested in golf. It's a great feeder program for Duan. In 2019, the city began to study a partnership with the Minnesota section of the PGA and the PGA Reach Foundation on a possible partnership for them to take over operations at Highland, lease the course, and reinvest in the golf course and facilities. The Minnesota section of the PGA had a change in leadership at the end of 2019, and then, of course, COVID hit. We're continuing conversations with them, but COVID has made even thinking about fundraising very difficult. However, an opportunity still potentially exists for them to take over operations of the course in 2021, and we're hoping to get an update on that um, as soon as possibly this week. As you can see in this slide, $300,000 is what is requested in tax support for the Gulf Enterprise. And I just again wanted to reiterate that both of our Gulf facilities are in significant need of capital reinvestment. For the long-term model, Highland Greens had years of expenses being more than revenues, which brought the working capital balance of the overall Gulf Fund significantly lower than the goals needed to fund capital improvements or emergency repairs. In 2016, the city started including an amount in the property tax levy to cover the net loss for Highland Greens, as well as rebuild the working capital balance. In 2021 and 2022, budget requests include $300,000 in property tax levy for golf, 
the majority for Highland, but also a portion for Dwan's operating operations as the 2021 budget revenues are less than Dwan's budgeted expenses. The working capital balance is shown in red because it ended in 2019 at only 11% of the goal for this fund and is projected to go up to 65% of the goal by 2025 with a $300,000 property tax levy each year. The Bloomington Center for the Arts is a vital, flourishing facility that's bursting at the seams with engaging educational and entertainment activities, serving people of all ages and increasingly diverse participants and audiences. More than 113,000 people visit the center for choir, music rehearsals, dance and art classes, gallery visits, and ticketed events each year. The BCA is also home to seven resident art organizations listed above. Each of these organizations also receives cultural arts grant funding from the city. This year, the total grants distributed is $173,000. The two largest awards are $80,000 for artistry, followed by Angelica at $32,000. 16 years after opening, the BCA continues to bustle with activity. We've been selling event tickets at 86% of capacity as compared to an industry average of 73%. We continue to foster additional arts engagement opportunities and have a vision to expand the facility in order to accommodate new and existing programs and expanded activities. An expansion of the center would leverage the facility's resounding success as a regional destination for artists and audiences. We hoped this would be paid for in part with a $10 million state bond funding. This bonding request received a fair amount of interest until COVID changed everyone's priorities this year. We uh, did withdraw our bonding request uh, for this uh, activity. The BCA is requesting $1 million in annual tax support. The BCA has only one full-time employee, but the facility is one of the most visited and valued in the city. In terms of the budget model, the fund balance of the BCA is in good shape as shown in green for 2019 to 2024. It dips down a little in 2025 to 89% of the goal. There's a one-time endowment transfer that will be received in 2021 of $1 million and that will be needed for capital improvements. The long-term model is projecting $50,000 in additional support for artistry from 2021 to 2025, which is $155,000 less than the $205,000 of support given to artistry for the previous five years. Big, the Bloomington Ice Garden, is our three-sheet indoor ice skating facility. It also opened in 1970 and is also 50 years old. Big is one of three metro rinks with three sheets of ice, which makes it very popular for games and tournaments. Tournaments regularly attract visitors from across the country. Here's a listing of hours rented and tournaments hosted since 2013. Due to COVID, Big closed on Friday, March 13th. It was scheduled to reopen on June 1st, and the National Guard moved in for almost a week due to the civil unrest in the metro area. We did reopen on June 8th, and we were able to reopen for tournaments in July. We're currently working to set up a live streaming service because we're not allowing um, a lot of spectators uh, for games and tournaments. And that live streaming opportunity will allow uh, family and friends to be able to watch games and tournaments from the comfort of their home. So we're excited to, uh, to get that service up and running very soon. We've spent over $2.3 million at Big since 2019. We renovated locker rooms, we added a new main vestibule and ADA viewing areas in rinks one and two, and we also installed LED lighting in all three rinks. We did receive $375,000 in grant funding to help assist with the cost on these projects. We received uh, $75,000 from the Craft Hockeyville Award and $300,000 from the Hennepin County Youth Sports Grant. 
With Big also being 50 years old, there's a lot of investment that is needed to bring the facility up to current mechanical and operational standards. The most critical and essential change is to change out the refrigeration system in all three rinks. We currently have Freon in all three rinks, and after 2019, Freon is no longer produced or imported into the United States due to environmental regulations. Most cities began planning for this change 10 years ago, and have, many have already completed their uh, renovations. Staff is currently recommending a thorough evaluation of mechanical, operational, and structural deficiencies so that we can best plan for system replacements. Just replacement of the refrigeration system alone in the three rinks and downsizing rink number three will cost over $6 million. Currently, BIG relies on an $80,000 property tax support for operations and an additional $191,000 tax support for debt service for the recent $2 million in improvements. I also worry that BIG is operating with two full-time um, staff, uh, with too few full-time staff, I'm sorry, creating a variety of operational challenges and inefficiencies. The working capital balance for BIG ended in 2019 in good shape, but is much lower than the goal for the fund for 2020 to 2022 due to lost revenues this year due to COVID. With fee increases, the working capital balance is projected to reach the goal for the fund in 2024. And with that, my team on uh, WebEx and I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, I'll open it up to questions. Neil? I've, I've got two. Um, one of them in regard to Highland, 300,000. Is that assuming you're going to reopen it in 21? That decision has not been made, but we have budgeted with the assumption that um, currently that we would be opening Highland next year. So the 300,000 would be to reopen it. Yes. But if that the is decision correct. was made to keep it closed, that money would not have to be spent? That is correct. Okay. The other question I had was on the. Um, where to go? The theater, BCA. Uh, last year, there's a the million dollar number. Uh, transfer from an endowment. Where, where's the endowment? And then also the tax fund of a million dollars. How do, how do you, how do I differentiate between those? And find it page now. But it was a million dollar number. Yep. The budgeted 21 because it was a transfer from endowment. And then the future budget says also a tax relief of a million dollars. Where's the endowment? Who's who's endowment? Well, I can, I can I don't know a lot about the uh, the endowment. I'll let Jamie answer that question. Uh, but there has been um, historically a um, million dollars in tax support to offset the cost to operate the BCA, and the million dollar endowment is a completely separate um, separate amount. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Peterson. Uh, Lori Economy Scholler actually has longer history here, so if I miss details, she can backstop me. When this building was constructed. Uh, the the BCA was an add-on, and uh, the the community members who were supporting arts in the community uh, asked the city council to support it. The council responded, as I understand it, um, by giving them an amount that they needed to step forward with as a, a community Snyder. commitment before they would uh, approve putting the project on the on the ballot for consideration and then it passed and that million dollars was the community support uh, for the art center and that requirement from the donor was that it be placed in an endowment for 20 years uh, and <clears throat> it was to uh, be held for future capital reinvestment so it was not to be used for operations um, over the course of those first 20 years. It was it was fully intended to um, plan for necessary uh, upgrades as the facility um, aged, and so the the term on the endowment has um, uh, has arrived, and so uh, we're looking at how we can utilize that uh, for capital purposes. Lori, anything that's else you want to add there? She's, she's that's the Snyder. That, it, yeah, that's correct. 
You'll need a microphone. The there term of the endowment um, ends when we pay the last debt service payment on February 1st of 2021. So that's when it becomes available. That was part of when this side of the building is completely paid off of for the debt, the endowment comes <coughs> to the city to be used for future capital needs. The, excuse me. For future capital needs for the city or for the north side of the building? For the art center side of the building. Okay. And if I may add, with the facility being 20 years old, we have a very extensive list of, uh, of items that are in need of replacement. Mm -hmm. Many of them even involve uh, safety issues mm -hmm. on, the, on the stage. John Gibbs. Yeah, thank you. Just on that endowment, so what would be the size of the endowment today? If it was a million dollars 20 years ago, what, how, what's it grown to? Commissioners and Commissioner Gibbs, um, annually the interest was swept into the city and in the amount generally in the neighborhood of about $15,000 to be used um, for minor capital needs. And that was part of the endowment um, information. So, so, it's, so it's still a million. A million. Okay. Right. The corpus remained. The interest was able to be um, brought into our um, capital budget. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chairs Pearson. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, two are like clarification, excuse me, clarification type questions. What is spike ball and what is pickleball? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oops, spike ball or pickleball? <laughs> Great questions. <laughs> um, spike ball is uh, is a game that's really popular uh, with younger people right now. It has um, uh, a net on an elevated stand um, on the ground and a group of players stand around the net and they hit the ball into the net and you're trying to, you're trying to keep the ball alive or, or get the ball past uh, people in teams. Okay. So that's spike ball. Uh, pickleball is, um, it's a game that is played on a smaller court than a tennis court. Um, in fact, if you picture the, the service lines, the lines that are up front on a, on a tennis court, that's the dimensions of a pickleball court. And it's played with a shorter paddle, like a racquetball style paddle, but it's a hard surface and you're playing with a ball that is like a wiffle ball. And um, it is a very, very popular game for people of all ages. They teach it in elementary school, and we have just a booming senior program and every age in between. And so um, locally, it is really growing. It started on both, um, both coasts, actually. It took a while to get to, uh, to the Midwest, but now it's just taking off like crazy. Uh, we have one set of dedicated pickleball courts, so they're courts just for pickleball, um, at Westwood Park in Bloomington, and um, we really should be considering building more. We're currently doing a park system master plan right now, and uh, pickleball is one of the top five sports growing nationally. Yeah, I drive by the pickleball court every day on the way to getting coffee, and it's and it, at nine o'clock in the morning when I'm doing the the, the <laughs> mid morning coffee run. It's full. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something I should look into yeah. then. Yeah. But I have some other more technical oh, questions yeah. besides the sports. Um, for the clarification, when is did I hear correctly that she said that registered or recognized sports um, teams don't are not charged for field usage in the city? And then that's one question. So if that's correct then. Is there um, a chance or opportunity to like license field usage or something that's so that you could maybe gather some sort of maintenance um, income for yes. the fields instead of charging back from the maintenance department? Yes. Just one question, I guess. Yes, that's a great question, and it is something that uh, that we have been exploring uh, for the past year. Um, as I mentioned, it's very unusual that we don't charge our athletic association anything for utilization of our fields. Um, there is not one consistent way that cities do it. Um, sometimes it's an hourly rate that they charge for the athletic associations. Some other cities charge a per-player fee uh, per season. 
uh, but we are absolutely um, exploring those possibilities for the future. Um, as you can imagine, uh, maintaining the fields for both practice and for games is a, is a very significant expense for the city. Right. Um, are those numbers available anywhere? I guess you maybe said 800000 was spent maybe annually on the maintenance, but... The, um, the, the, the actual numbers um, are in the park maintenance budget um, for what is charged back for the to, um, to, this, to the uh, Parks and Recreation uh, Department. Um, just to give you a, a couple of ideas, um, our fees charged back to recreation for adult sports um, is $250,000. So that's the cost to maintain the fields for adult sports. And it's almost $1 million uh, for youth athletics. And the park maintenance team does track their time. So those are actual costs to maintain those facilities. Okay, thank you. Um, and then another clarification question was about the maybe the Galaxy Youth Center support. Did you say that um, there's gonna be, for 2021, a reduction um, in what we cover for inclusion services? We currently, well, historically, the city has provided uh, two separate amounts in support to the school district. Um, one was $133,000 to Galaxy, and the second was $35,000 in inclusion services that we're actually providing for school district um, after school programs. So uh, last year we had conversations with the, with the school district about the cost to the city, the fact that the school district actually has staff on site that is familiar with these students and could provide these services. So the school district um, was willing to take over those services. Okay. So the services aren't going away. They just will be assumed by school district staff. Which makes sense. Um, and, and can I just uh, jump in there too? The, the interest of the city, um, because you know you might want to ask the question, why, why are we providing essentially uh, assistance for school district programming? Uh, this program goes back uh, in a couple decades, and, and the interest from the city is um, recognizing that having structured, supervised um, time for youth outside of school hours uh, is a, a public safety interest for our, our young people and for the community. And so I think that has been the primary rationale to support that program, uh, just in addition to the fact that having structured supervised programming for young people is generally good for the development of young people. Completely agree. Um, then a final question, which is not super related to those two questions, was um, how the City of Bloomington Parks and Recreation programs um, or enrichment programs compares to something like the City of Minneapolis. So I realized when I was looking for activities pre-COVID, the city of Minneapolis parks and recs programs or the community education programs seem to be a bit more affordable than the city of Bloomington programs. I don't know if you guys influence the cost for classes like um, Minneapolis does or not, but I guess why does it seem so expensive for um, enrichment programs in the city or how does that work? Like, For example, the ceramics classes here that are offered was maybe like a hundred and something dollars for a six or eight week course and then the same type of class for intro to ceramics was maybe seventy dollars in minneapolis at a activity center so i am not a hundred percent sure the programs that that you're comparing but i'm guessing that some of the programs that you're talking about are not programs that are offered through bloomington parks and recreation it very well might be a uh, Bloomington Community Ed program. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and okay. those programs aren't aren't ours. They're run through the school district. So I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good questions. So the one one thing I want to follow up on the the question that you had because I think it was a good question about the um, kind of field use mm -hmm. fee. Um, I think that you know a, a lot of our conversation on the revenue side has been looking at like kind of tax revenue and we haven't really, we, we haven't really, we, this is kind of the first time that there's been like a revenue kind of sort of thing coming forward here. Um, I think in terms of, I think there's also a, a reason to do it beyond just the revenue generation, which I think it helps people kind of uh, think correctly about 
reserving time and making sure that the, that the time that they're reserving is time that's actually being used and being efficient about that. And so uh, as, as we kind of have the conversation here, at least me personally, I'd like to make sure that you're thinking about that and coming back with a proposal that would include that because I think this we, we have a really big gap here. It's clearly not something that's going to go a long ways toward closing the gap, but I think it's, you know, we're looking everywhere for opportunities to do this and, and having a, a model that doesn't charge back everything, but, you know, has a cost associated with it so that people, people's behavior around reserving space and using it is consistent is I think that's a worthwhile thing to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and I appreciate the support in that. Um, we really do um, view that as something that is essential for us to do moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, we're not quite there yet in terms of what our recommendation would be. Uh, we would like to bring a recommendation forward through the Park System Master Plan. I would like to work with our city manager. It has typically been my past practice to give our athletic association a, a year heads up uh, when we're going to be making what I would consider to be a significant increase in the fees that we're charging to them. So that would be something that I would want to work through uh, with Jamie as well as to how quickly we would be able to implement that fee and not have it be overly burdensome for our, um, our athletic associations. Okay, I think that's a good point. I, 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 my expectation is that in 2022 we'll still be looking for money. So mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, uh, let's see. I think John, did you have something? Actually, that was going to be my point. That this probably isn't a one-year look anyway. Right. So I I relish that conversation as well. I'm just thinking about um, as we take this up, then in a month or two or whenever that that would come up. I think it would be very helpful to see some of those comps. You know, you indicated the Bloomington's unusual in how we do it, and others do it different way. You know, I think the benchmarking on this particular one could be pretty uh, useful. So to the extent that we could get some information on what some of the other cities are doing and maybe some of the uh, private foundations or other support schemes that are out there to try to keep those fees down either to the groups or to the individuals. I know there are some. I don't know much about this, though, but I know there are some out there, and I think that would be very helpful to you know, jump into that conversation. Yes, absolutely. You raise another really great <laughs> point. Um, and uh, a Parks Foundation is another great opportunity for the city to pursue. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that we are seeing an increased need for fee assistance, and um, a lot of cities have programs set up through foundations to help cover the cost of those fee assistance programs and also capital improvements for, uh, for parks and facilities as well. So that's something that we have also been discussing, um, and we will definitely be making a recommendation on that as part of the Park System Master Plan as well. Okay, other questions for Ann? Josh. Uh, Ann, excellent job. Uh, as I was listening to you, I was reminded why our family moved to Bloomington a number of years ago, the amenities, the quality of life, which to me uh, is a big part of how we attract and keep families with kids, which then go to our schools, and it just is a huge part of the community. And um, so just a really good job laying that out. I was also struck by how many times you said the year 1950. Um, and we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago about our buildings and uh, the history of this suburb and when it really started to grow is indicative and when the buildings were created. And I'm struck by how some of them are uh, in great need of repair mm -hmm. and how we have to make some tough choices. So I would welcome kind of recommendations from you as you look at this, kind of what the strategy is for the long term and where we may want to close and shutter some of our facilities and where we may need to invest more so that we can continue to keep and attract families and looking at the diversity and where the community is going to grow over time. Um, and I'll just offer some just for consideration as a huge champion of the work uh, that you all do. But with climate change and the weather, I just don't know if we can afford some of the outdoor rinks like we used to. I spent a lot of time you know, in, those, in those parks, and they just don't get the use that they used to probably 25 or 30 years ago. So if you would take a look at that, um, and maybe there's ways to uh, provide access to, to big for, you know, for kids who can't afford it, and there's other ways to, we, uh, to waive it. Uh, the second piece is Creekside, I think, needs a hard look in terms of long-term 
kind of future viability, just looking at how much money is spent on parts of the building um, that could be invested in people uh, moving forward. Um, and then Highland, um, I, I guess I think it would be good for us to hear what the future of the Highland uh, facility is, especially since the PGA uh, kind of pulled out. Um, and as a hockey dad and a proud hockey dad, uh, the Bloomington Ice Garden continues to need some uh, upgrades and uh, recognizing the challenges here, I guess I would urge the city to take another look at some sort of public-private partnership around a naming rights. Um, and there may be some corporate partners who'd be willing to uh, uh, make a long-term commitment. And I know you've got partners uh, in kind of the hockey community that are willing to kind of look into that. That could be one way to finance some of the things that need to get done, Freon and others, over the long term to, uh, uh, to work on that. So I just would welcome concrete, specific recommendations when we come back at it next time and, and help give this committee uh, some options to look at. And, um, and I'll speak just for myself. I'm happy to engage some of the other youth uh, sports organizations in town to help with that dialogue and to really foster uh, engagement. So just let me know when ready to do that. So. Thank you very much. Yep. I'd allowed 45 minutes for this. I want to have a final check to see if anybody else had questions before we take our break. <laughs> uh, John. Maybe just a placeholder. It sounds like we're coming back on this. I like the idea of a, a deeper dive on, on Highland Greens. Um, and especially if, if one partner you know dis, disappears, I don't know if that's likely or not, but um, I would just offer up I know our experience at Three Rivers has been e extremely profitable this year, but for a number of years, that that real sweet spot, the facilities that we have that are most used, are the most profitable, are these instructional courses, shorter courses, and the ones that have a practice range with them. And um, so I, I assume there's, there's a way to make that work. I, it's probably too late in the year to restart Highland Greens, um, you know, so maybe this is a lost year for Highland Greens, uh, but I would say it might be worth looking at uh, because I know that our facilities are full every single day, every piece of them, um, and have been since the governor's order, you know, which was, what, late May. So there may be a few dollars to pick up still this year. I know there are expenses to ramping back up, but in terms of, you know, any alignments, you know, going forward, I, I think that it is really an opportunity for partnership and then if, if we come back on some of the revenue, I'm assuming the revenue at Bush Lake is probably parking revenue mostly, or maybe it's rental facilities. Yes, it is. But if there are any other, just sort of in this theory of alignment, you know, if there are any other things that come to your mind that we might offer up in, in terms of synergies with Highland Park and Bush Lake being, you know, a continuous, a contiguous, you know, sort of regional planning thing, I would be happy to champion anything that, you know, makes the whole net to less expense, you know, because largely they're almost seamless in some ways. So I just throw those thoughts out, not necessarily for tonight, but if we come back at this, none of these will be huge dollars, but I think they add up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Three Rivers has been a tremendous partner uh, with the city of Bloomington. Thank you. Any other comments before we go on break? Okay, with that, we'll take a break until 7.55.
Alrighty, we'll restart the meeting. Uh, and next up is item 4.4, the Community Development Department and Heather Worthington. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, I'm Heather Worthington. I'm the Interim Community Development Director and Kari is going to advance slides for me. Thank you, Kari. Um, I think you are probably familiar with what the Community Development Department does, but you, I'm gonna take this off. But you, might, but you might not realize all of the different divisions that are uh, within the community development department. So I want to talk a little bit about that to get started here. Um, community development is really about um, enhancing Bloomington through planning and economic development and environmental health inspections. Um, we have in the general fund assessing building and inspections, environmental health and planning. And then we have two separate component units as our finance friends call them. And that's Housing and Redevelopment Authority and the Port Authority. Um, and you might be wondering, why does Bloomington have a port? Well, why not? Um, <laughs> it's another way to do economic development in the city and it was a legislative allowance that was made for the city um, probably back in the 1960s or 70s. So it, uh, it's been around for quite a while. Um, community development is really about um, driving and encouraging and supporting and preserving economic growth in the city. Uh, and this team of just shy of, I think they're just around 80, um, does really incredible work. Um, so, go ahead. Um, primarily what we're, what we're involved in is uh, strategy, planning, and zoning, which you know is pretty typical for community development. Um, we also facilitate economic growth through um, building uh, inspections and activities. Um, we try to educate our customers about compliance and encourage voluntary compliance rather than um, a heavy regulatory presence. Uh, and, and we're also working through the HRA with city ordinances and delegated state codes and federal housing assistance. So, um, for instance, we have 551 HRA uh, units uh, in the city, or vouchers, excuse me, um, and that is a, not only a source of income for that program, but also assists in providing affordable housing to our residents. Um, we have delegated uh, responsibilities through the state, uh, which includes our environmental health um, division, which does restaurant inspections, um, and they've been extremely busy in the last several months, as you can imagine. And then um, we have some mandated duties uh, that flow through the state uh, and statute, and then we have some discretionary duties, so we'll talk about those a little bit as well. Our primary duties are really to assist um, the city manager and the city council, the planning commission, in developing the city's long-term and strategic plans, and that includes things like our comprehensive plan. The 2040 comprehensive plan for the city is a um, decade-long decade strategic document that really helps the city determine how it will develop and redevelop over time and how it will prioritize and phase various services. And then we implement those city plans um, both through our uh, statutory authority as a city and through the HRA and Port Authority uh, powers. Um, we also operate some discretionary programs, um, which include these, um, nuisance control, property maintenance, rental housing, uh, licensing and inspections, time of sale inspections, um, and zoning, which is really a statutory um, program through, the, uh, through state ordinances, and then business licensing and inspections, which are not state delegated. So there are some that are state delegated and some that are not. This is our staffing and structure, as I mentioned. Um, I am the interim director. Um, I began uh, my time with the city in early March, and um, most recently I was employed by the city of Minneapolis as their long-range planning director, and prior to that with Ramsey County as the deputy county manager uh, for economic growth and community investment. Um, within our department, we have the city assessor, uh, the, which is Matt Gershmull, the building and inspection manager, Duke Johnson, our environmental health manager, Lynn Moore. Uh, we have an open or vacant uh, spot for the HRA administrator. We are in the process of filling that position. Uh, the Port Authority administrator, who you probably know, Shane Rudling. Our planning manager, Glenn Markegaard, and our special projects and initiatives manager, Barb Wolf. Um, these were our budget requests for 2021 by division. Um, and you can see that we're broken down. These are the, um, the non-special funded uh, portions. So this is everybody but uh, HRA and uh, Port Authority. And we will talk about those a little bit separately. Um, I wanna stress tonight that um, 
in addition to the important activities that we um, accomplish as a city department, um, like ensuring, I need to move this just a little bit, ensuring that um, buildings are safe and that uh, public health and uh, environmental health in particular is maintained, we also generate a, quite a bit of revenue for the city, both through permitting, um, and these permits you can see here, which are typical building permit revenue, but also through licensing and inspections and then development fees that we charge. Bloomington, like most cities in the metro area, has experienced um, a period of very high growth in terms of development uh, over the last decade or so, and um, so we have generated quite a bit of revenue through those development fees for the city, and that includes plan review and development, rezone and signs. Signs are a huge, um, a huge planning um, uh, issue for us because of 494 and some of the commercial areas where we have large um, commercial property owners who want large signs, and so we do a lot of sign work. I will tell you right now that um, <laughs> estimating revenues for 2021 was extremely difficult. I'm probably not the first person to say that to you. Um, but uh, one of the things that I think we're all concerned about right now is that we, we feel that we may be approaching a cliff when it comes to development um, and sort of the um, pace of development that we've experienced over the last decade or so. So we did try to be relatively conservative in our estimates for revenue for 2021. And you can see that um, we're still estimating a fair amount of revenue for 2021, <clears throat> excuse me, um, both through permitting and licensing um, and then through development, um, development fees. Uh, but again, I want to stress that this is an estimate and the next few months will really be, I think, instructive for us in terms of uh, determining what will happen with a vaccine and with um, the unemployment rate in particular, uh, which is obviously very concerning to us. Um, our assessor, Matt Gershmal, and Shane Rudling from the Port Authority have both um, talked with you about this and, and some of the... Um, uh, very data-driven approach that they have taken to trying uh, trying to estimate revenues for the city as a whole, but also for community development. Go ahead, Kari. Thanks. Um, I just want to touch briefly on the goals of the Community Development Department, um, and I won't read these to you. Um, you have them in your packet, but um, stressing that really um, I, I would characterize the role of this department as maintaining the desirability of this community through addressing things like blight and property condition and environmental health, and then also focusing on the redevelopment opportunities within this um, very, very important sub-market of the Twin Cities. Um, Bloomington um, represents a, an incredible opportunity for housing development in particular. There aren't very many green um, uh, green lots here in Bloomington, but there are a lot of redevelopment opportunities. And someone noted earlier um, that the um, the relative age of this uh, community as a suburb of uh, the Twin Cities really does lend itself nicely to some redevelopment opportunities. And so we are, you know, we are constantly looking uh, at how we can be more proactive about redevelopment in the community and trying to increase uh, affordable housing. Uh, construction at all levels, uh, and also trying to um, pr promote redevelopment and improvements in neighborhood nodes that are important commercial uh, generators in terms of interest of people moving into the area, shopping, um, and goods and services. Um, and then through the Port Authority, we really have a more targeted approach to redevelopment, and so this is where we have um, the South Loop vision. Um, which is really about transforming uh, a dispersed suburban commercial area into a walkable urban neighborhood. Um, you know, Bloomington is one of the few suburbs, um, although the Southwest Light Rail project seems to be going forward, but we're one of the few suburbs that have really good um, transit penetration. And so looking to um, really optimize that in terms of the development that is around that light rail stop and Mall of America. And and then through our Housing and Redevelopment Authority, really focusing on affordable housing opportunities and especially preservation of existing naturally occurring or NOAA uh, affordable housing. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, I'm going to go through each division briefly here. Um, again, this is in your packet, so I won't read these slides to you. But I want to um, focus really on um, assessing um, every five-year 
parcel review of 32,000 parcels. Um, that is a significant effort uh, in the city and really um, not just required by state statutes, but helps to keep the city on a firm footing in terms of that revenue estimate over time and ensuring that property values are uh, fair and equitable in terms of the assessment and then the applied um, uh, mill rate. And then um, talking about um, annual valuation uh, and classification, um, we, in assessing, um, they successfully achieved proactive MOA settlements uh, for the past 16 years that totaled $11.1 billion of value. Um, we had a period of time in the late 1990s when MOA and the city were in tax court, and um, uh, I think that, that that relationship and that process has settled nicely to the advantage of the city. Next slide. In building and inspections, you know, we're, um, it's actually really interesting, uh, beginning in, I'd say, April, um, the city started to see a huge uptick in what I'm going to call smaller residential projects that are driving quite a bit of value and revenue for the department. And um, these are things like additions onto homes, quite a few swimming pools this year, which has been really interesting. But, you know, people are home and the kids are home, and so they're putting in a pool. Um, and then uh, our building and inspections division um, uh, is really proud of the fact that they generate 100% of uh, their expenses through their revenue collection. Um, so they are a self-sustaining division. Um, they run our time of sale inspection program, which is a really important program in that it identifies for potential homeowners um, deficiencies with a property that then can be repaired uh, uh, by the new homeowner or by the existing homeowner prior to sale. And of course, they do building permits for large-scale projects. Um, and you see these all over Bloomington right now. We're still seeing lots of cranes in the air in Bloomington, lots of, um, in particular, multifamily housing uh, that's being built right now. Primarily, I would say, because of very low interest rates and access to capital for developers. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that as well. Next slide. Um, our envir environmental health department <coughs> is um, Part of our goal of, of providing safe housing, safe and affordable housing, and uh, mitigating um, illnesses that can occur um, because of um, food or waterborne um, contaminants, we license and inspect rental housing, we enforce city nuisance and zoning codes, and um, we also have a delegation agreement with Richfield for providing uh, restaurant inspections. We also um, look at uh, hotels and uh, public pools and spas um, and wells. So um, there's quite a wide variety of inspections that our uh, environmental health inspectors um, complete each year. And I think the other, the other thing I just want to point out about environmental health is that they have a very strong and productive partnership with um, our um, in, uh, hospitality community, which is very important to Bloomington in terms of the um, uh, local economy. So that's a very important feature of the work they do. Our Housing and Redevelopment Authority um, is our primary affordable housing program provider. Um, they also work on redevelopment of um, parcels throughout the city um, that are either blighted or um, uh, good candidates for renewal or, pr or preservation and improvement. And um, they do a lot of proactive work to partner with the development community to achieve those goals. They um, provide housing stability to over 600 families a month. And as I mentioned, um, there are five, I, I think we're gonna see a slide in just a minute. There are about five um, projects in the development pipeline right now that are affordable. Um, for the uh, Opportunity Housing Ordinance, the OHO, which was adopted by the City Council last year. And so that's a, um, something we want to touch on a little bit in a little bit more detail. In planning, um, we do uh, development review services. We do also long-range planning. I mentioned the comprehensive plan. And we staff the Planning Commission. Um, uh, these are um, the kind of baseline strategic direction that the city follows to think about redevelopment and development of new um, new parcels in the city uh, over time. And so planning is a really foundational part of what cities do. Um, and we we also negotiate wireless, wireless leases uh, and generate about $700,000 in revenue through those leases each year. So planning is, um, 
is also uh, generating revenue for the city uh, through development review and those wireless leases. Next slide. The Port Authority, as you know, um, oversees and promotes development within South Loop. Uh, it also facilitates redevelopment and economic growth with uh, private sector development partners. So this is a way that the city can leverage um, funds that are uh, outside of city coffers, outside of our tax base, to um, to the benefit of the city long term. Um, Shane's also uh, our primary coordinator uh, for legislative policies, and so you'll also see him with that hat on as well. Um, there are six projects currently under construction uh, in the South Loop. Um, and they total over $1 billion since 2013, so just in the last seven years. Um, and, you'll, and you'll see these cranes, again, you'll see some of these cranes down in the South Loop area. We don't see that development pace slowing right now. Uh, there are some projects that have approached us who are in the pipeline and asked to um, have uh, some additional conversations about slight delays, but again, with interest rates being so low, we continue to see um, a pretty active development um, uh, community within Bloomington. We also have a creative placemaking um, uh, element within community development. This is attached to the Port Authority, and these are um, ways that we can um, build more walkable, distinctive, and vibrant communities, and really contribute to things like social cohesion and honoring the cultural assets of the community. And so these are things like major mural, mural projects, which you can see in the middle there. We also do um, cultural, um, cultural community work through festivals and other kinds of gatherings. And this is also um, something that most cities in America are realizing now is really important to spurring economic development because it makes these areas more interesting <coughs> for people to visit and to patronize in terms of businesses. So creative placemaking is a small thing that we do that has a big impact. And then in, in our special projects and initiatives um, division, this is a new division that was created last year and really what they're doing is coordinating and implementing strategic priorities and objectives. And they, an example of some of the work that they've done is the Lindale, um, Lindale study that they completed, or they're in the process of completing right now and will complete this fall. And um, they also are working with the HRA on the Gateway District, uh, which is another important redevelopment opportunity for the city. We talked earlier about the OHO, and this was, I think, perhaps one of the most important groundbreaking pieces of local policy in Minnesota in the last two years that has really impacted the uh, affordable housing market um, uh, through the preservation of NOAA and then through the construction of new affordable housing. Go ahead. Um, these are the uh, three developments that have um, come to fruition since the adoption of OHO, the district, um, Gateway Southwest, and Lindale Flats. And these are, um, I'm sorry, uh, these three areas, um, I'm reading this slide incorrectly. There we go, pre-opportunity development. 2019 to 20 is the orange, there we go. Um, so these were projects that were already in the pipeline when OHO was adopted. Then. Um, OHO potential projects in the middle in gray, and then um, future projects, uh, Lindale Flats um, is a project that we hope will come online uh, later this year. Rosa Development, currently under construction. Village Club um, is well under construction, and the fix up of that property is um, still occurring. So this is just kind of a quick overview of some of the, the projects that we have uh, in the pipeline right now. And then I also just wanted to give you kind of an idea of where they fall within the city. So there's a, a map here just showing um, where the uh, various projects are located. And you can see we have pretty decent distribution throughout the city between East and West Bloomington and um, between market rate and affordable. Um, I will tell you that candidly that um, the construction of affordable housing at 30% of area median income and below is still very difficult. Um, there are not very many uh, good financing options for developers and that, that is still kind of the, um, that's kind of the golden ring, the thing we're trying really hard to, uh, to bring in in 2021 and 22 
sadly, we think there will be much more need for that segment of affordable housing as well. So that's a that's an additional um, piece of this uh, puzzle that we're looking at. But Village Club um, has 17 units that are affordable at 30 percent of AMI. So we are seeing some construction, but it is um, incredibly difficult to achieve um, higher levels of 30 and below. So that tends to be um, difficult for all cities. I think uh, these are the non-residential projects in the pipeline. Um, we've got a couple of um, commercial uh, projects. Uh, Luther Subaru is uh, coming in for sign permits in the next few weeks. Um, and so we're, we're we're still moving, I think, really well for uh, an economy that is in um, a bit of disarray right now. I think we can all agree that um, we're surprised by the level of interest and continuing uh, movement in the development market in Bloomington. But I think that speaks to the quality of this um, community and the value that is placed on um, maintaining and um, refreshing uh, those spaces from time to time every so many decades. And I think that really makes a big difference. So I think your investment as a community in um, in those um, affordable housing and market rate housing and non-residential projects is really important in, in maintaining interest in the market. Again, um, these are our revenue estimates for 2021. I, I will not read this to you. I mean, that would put you right to sleep, wouldn't it? Um, and then uh, I think the next slide, this might be our last slide, actually. That's it. So thank you very much. I'm happy to stand for questions. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs> Jamie. Mr. Co-Chairs, before we get into questions, I did want to make one uh, additional comment that I didn't even warn Heather about. Um, and that's uh, actually talking about gaps, and that's something that you didn't see in the presentation. Uh, one of the conversations that the City Council has had from time to time over the uh, five and a half years that I've been here is in the area of economic development. Uh, Maureen knows this conversation well from her time at the Chamber, we have uh, vigorous uh, development activity occurring through our HRA and our Port Authority and through our planning division. We do not have anybody on staff who is specifically uh, tasked with doing the work of economic development. And so when you think about the traditional economic development coordination work, you're talking about uh, interfacing with the business community to understand their uh, expansion needs, uh, their, their growth objectives, uh, their employment concerns, uh, having a business retention and expansion, expansion strategy. Uh, it's the, the work of um, coordinating um, responses to uh, site selection uh, proposals, uh, that work tends to fall on various people, all of whom do it as well as they can. Uh, for the most part, it's Shane Rudling, our Port Authority Administrator, who ends up uh, picking that work up or at least detailing it to his staff. Uh, but that's, that's an area that I think um, would serve Bloomington well. And each year that the uh, council has talked about this, it has essentially not risen up to the point of making it into that final conversation because usually at the end of the year, we're, we're tending to reduce our <laughs> budgets instead of adding more things to them. Uh, but if you look at where we are today and understanding the impact that our current environment is having on uh, businesses and then thinking about who the businesses are for the future and how we create a community that is going to be attractive for people to make investments in for uh, business startup. It's an area that, um, frankly, has probably gone too long without attention. Um, we have, Heather can correct me on the number since they were just doing work on this with our Small Business Assistance Loan Program. We have, I think, about 2,000 registered business enterprises in the city. Uh, our chamber uh, has historically represented uh, less than 20% of that, at least in the last 10 years or so. So there's a, there's a pretty significant gap in the relationship, uh, knowing who is in our business community and what their needs are. Uh, and that's something that you might want to think about as you're, uh, as you're considering how development and business um, concern fits in with the total community need. I'll just add that um, 
we are trying to be much more proactive about outreach to those businesses so that we can identify their needs, not just through that small business um, uh, loan program, but also on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, this is a great time for us to do that outreach because I think that small businesses in particular are going to be reevaluating what their future looks like and trying to determine are they going to have a physical uh, presence in the community? Is it going to be online? How are they going to um, staff and, and, and handle um, HR issues? And there's a really wide variety of, um, of things that are facing them right now. So, mm -hmm. uh, Maureen, you had a question? Um, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Uh, thank you, Heather. A very good presentation. Jamie, thank you so much for your comments regarding investment and in economic development and kind of um, strategically looking at that. And um, I feel just as strongly about that today as I did uh, in my nine years running the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. So um, again, I think it's something that's very important for the city. Uh, we do have an organization called Greater MSP but they're really focusing on regionalism and they're not looking specifically at individual cities. So um, continue the efforts on that, please. Um, I do have a question regarding two questions. One is um, over for the Port Authority in South Loop, you currently have six projects under construction totaling over one billion since 2013. How many of those are hotel developments or hotels? I'm not sure I can answer that question. Uh, um, we only have one hotel currently. Only one in, hotel? Uh, in construction, and that is uh, Hyatt House. It's at the corner of Old Shakopee Road in 86, across from our, our new fire station. Uh, the Cambria Hotel just opened uh, in South Loop. Uh, prior to that, I, I believe the um, Hyatt Place uh, was the the last new one, and then we have the to the Town Place Suites that's uh, across the street from Mall of America. Uh, I think I've shared the number with you before. We have forty seven hotels. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we have, uh, and I do I, that does not include the Hyatt House. Uh, we also have an approval outside of South Loop, but uh, an approval for. Uh, a Drury Hotel at um, France and 494, actually Minnesota, um, Minnesota Road. Mm -hmm. And that one uh, is on hold. Uh, and I, it, based on the current uh, economic situation, I'd be surprised if that one moves forward. We're also um, uh, getting uh, contacts from uh, developers who are interested in converting hotels into um, residential uses. I think that that's going to be a conversation that is prominent in the next couple of years as the lodging industry settles out a little bit. Uh, so we've been we've been steadily adding uh, hotel uh, units every year, uh, and I, I think we're probably going to be pausing that for a couple of years. Um, right, th thank you, uh, Heather. So. Being a revenue generator for your permits and, and all that, when we look at projects in the pipeline for non-residential versus residential, do you know what the percent of that is between the two that generates revenue? I can get that for you. I don't have that mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Thank mm -hmm. you. Other questions? Sure. Akia and then uh, Neil. Thanks, Chair Peterson. A couple of questions for you. Um, what does affordable mean in this context? What does affordable mean uh, for residential? Uh, Both, I guess, for rental properties, or sorry, rentals and homes, I suppose. Right, and when we talk about um, affordable housing in, in this context, um, primarily what we're talking about is um, for rental affordability. And we are looking at that 30, 50, 60, 80, up to 100, usually 15% of the area median income. Um, and the area median income in Bloomington is slightly lower than the metro, uh, primarily because of the um, hourly wage of residents. Uh, it tends to be lower in Bloomington. Um, so affordability is slightly different than the metro average for affordability as we look at that. Do you have like a number, for example, of like, the 80%, I don't know what the 
median. Yes, um, I do. I, what I can do is send you all, I think what would be most helpful is if I sent you the presentation we gave the council on August 10th, which uh, really breaks that out very nicely by um, income and shows comparable um, uh, jobs that generate that level of income. So I think that's really helpful. That was, I think, information that um, the council found to be very um very useful. So I'll make sure that we send that to all of you so that you have that. And I'm glad that Heather mentioned the issue about the Bloomington median income versus the regional median income, uh, because the, <clears throat> the, the affordability criteria that we use for development uh, follows what the Met Council and Minnesota Housing uses. It's, it's what's used for the um, Twin Cities uh, MSA, the is that the Metropolitan yes. Statistical Area, yeah. which is the federal designation, the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington, MSA. So the the area median income um, drives the numbers when we're putting a, a development project together. So if we're looking at 60% uh, AMI, or even at these lower, the 30% AMI, it's a challenge from a financing perspective. But then we also have to recognize that it actually isn't quite meeting the local need because our median income still is below that figure, right? And so there's a, there, we've had some conversation about how do you accommodate that um, need so that we don't have renters who continue to be cost burdened by the rent. And if you recall that cost burden conversation from a couple meetings ago, um, that's, just, that's just one of our challenges in terms of trying to meet the need within the community. And the community tends to be cost burdened at around 40% of their income for housing. So it is much higher than the 30% that you hear referred to frequently um, uh, for planning purposes, 30% of your income for housing. Uh, Bloomington residents who rent are more likely to be paying somewhere around 40% of their income for housing. Yeah, I was curious about that because I live at Indigo and then the Finley just opened and I think like one bedroom is around 1500 on average. I'm just like, who is, yeah. what? This is not inexpensive or affordable, but maybe it is according to statistics or the parameters, which is fine. Um, it is pretty stunning. <laughs> it is. Uh, I had a question about something you're talking about early on in your presentation about the smaller home projects coming forward. Um, and my question about this is, I guess, land use and how it's zoned. Um, I was talking to someone recently about a tiny house or like a small um, house. So it could be on a foundation or it could be like on a trailer or something like that. That's a really cool idea. And as a young person, I would love to have like a gooseneck trailer and live in a tiny house. But where am I going to find the property to like put it that's safe and in a decent area or that's um, affordable to like buy the property to use or rent? Ooh, that, I feel like that doesn't exist in like metropolitan areas where people want to live, and it might exist here, and I don't know, but that's something that's curious to me, and I feel like could it be an opportunity for, I guess, either the Port Authority, I don't know, or the, who did you mention? Um, one of your other departments to look into is how, we're, I guess, zoning, the zoning department would be interesting. Um, because that would be another affordable type option for people to right. have homes or even rent homes, I guess, that are really affordable. This is more of a statement rather than a question. Could it be a question if it's on a future plan, but okay. Yeah. Um, and then the next thing you talked about was transit. And I guess, how are we investing mm -hmm. in transit um, in Bloomington? And what type of transit-oriented development are we doing? So should we use like the Mall of America line and the blue line, but that's really limited. There's not a lot of bus opportunities within the core of Bloomington. Right. Yeah, east to west, um, thank you. Those are just really helpful questions. Um, east to west transit penetration in Bloomington is really quite poor. Um, and it, it that tends to be a challenge throughout the metro. Um, there are uh, mm -hmm. um, certain communities experience it on a north-south basis, but um, Bloomington has an east-west problem. Um, I, I would just suggest that s cities don't directly invest in transit per se, but what we do is we create a land use environment that supports transit through our zoning and through our land use regulation. So um, what, what, what I think Bloomington has done over the last few years, and you can go back to that slide that's before this one, I think, Kari, if you don't mind. Thank you. You can see that um, when I mentioned earlier that um, you're seeing nice 
a nice distribution of housing development throughout the city in terms of driving um, higher densities in certain areas that can support higher frequency transit. So that's really the that's kind of just the basic idea behind it is that you're you're actually trying to um, create nodes or um, interest areas where you can see increased frequency of transit. And one of those areas would be American Boulevard, yep. um, which is a natural um, kind of connection a connection point to the Blue Line and then um, to to the West. So that's something that um, I think. In the metro area, you know, the, the legislative funding is what's necessary to support transit investment. And um, that has been a very difficult hill to climb in the last few years. Um, so it's something that uh, cities continue to struggle with and work on in terms of really improving um, the land use regulation that supports higher, higher frequency transit. Thanks. Uh, Neil and then Jessica. Uh, quick question on the... What is the gateway project? You talk about the gateway. Is that up at 100 and 494? That, no. Mm -mm. The gateway area is uh, Lindale at 98th. Oh, okay. Right. And so. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me jump okay. in. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, the, um, so the gateway development district is our newest TIF district that was approved uh, last year. And it's actually a very sizable area. Uh, it came out of the process a couple of years ago. Um, one of the council's six priorities is focused renewal. And as part of that study, we looked at the neighborhood commercial nodes around the community uh, to determine the priorities for reinvestment or potential reinvestment in those nodes. And uh, those nodes, uh, especially the ones that needed reinvestment, unsurprisingly, you'll, you'll know this from uh, uh, driving around the community, uh, 98th and Nicollet, 98th and Lindale, the Lindale Avenue Corridor, Portland and American, uh, Cedar Avenue and Old Shakopee, uh, that intersection. Uh, though, so in your mind, and as you look at the map, you suddenly have a square that has kind of developed. So the Gateway Development District is is almost entirely the east side, not including South Loop. So it's it's most of the area east of 35W, but it also comes in a little bit to capture 90th and Penn because that was one of the other neighborhood commercial nodes that was um, in need of uh, uh, reinvestment. So follow up. So if it if it's in that large TIF. How will the community benefit from the taxes that are paid by those improvements? What's going to help have an 82nd DuPont? And I'll and kind of couple that with my be in my bonnet that you're doing this billion dollars in South Loop. And how many of those dollars are coming back into Bloomington to help 82nd and Colfax? I mean, that's that's always the dilemma. You put them in a TIF, the TIF captures all the tax revenue, and then you get these big pools of money that you can't ever touch. And here we are struggling with budgets and how tall to cut the grass in the parks and that kind of thing. Is there a, do you have a response other than that I'm nuts? So uh, with TIF, I would say it doesn't capture all of the taxes within the district. It, catch, it captures the increment. So the, the base tax at the time that the district is established remains on Same. tax yeah. rolls. Right. Um, so uh, back to the South Loop conversation, because I'm <laughs> sure this is one we're going to continue to have. Uh, here's, <laughs> here's what I would like the committee members to uh, visualize, is the geographic footprint for South Loop is essentially the same amount of uh, uh, area uh, as the core business district of downtown Minneapolis. Okay? It's a really big area, and it's going to take uh, a lot of time for that whole area to build out and develop. So the, you know, the efforts that we are putting forward into South Loop is – is entirely a long-range planning exercise. And that long-range planning exercise began back in 1983 when, um, you know, the Met Stadium uh, was about to be demolished and the planning for that area began. Uh, so, 
you know, it's not that all of the um, all of the revenue is being lost from a long range planning perspective. A lot of that revenue came back in 2017 when the TIF district, the first TIF district for the area around the Mall of America expired. And uh, the second TIF district expired in 2019. So that revenue came back onto the tax rolls. Um, you know, it's, it, it's entirely a conversation about how much resource do you commit to, um, to that long range vision and how much you're willing to tie up. Uh, one of the, one of the details that we are looking at uh, this week in our staff meeting talking about South Loop is just the, um, the rate of collection in a couple of these um, project areas is such that we can probably um, close them out earlier because they've been so successful. And so they don't have to um, stay open for the entire uh, time. And that becomes a policy decision for the council and the port authority when those, when, when those um, dates arrive. You, you, could, you could probably button my lip if you start giving us some of those numbers. I mean, I don't have any idea of what you're gaining now by the TIFs expiring. So that would help my unbelief. We'll, uh, we'll pull together information uh, from the 2017 and the 2019 TIF expirations. Um, it's just instructive to see. Yeah. It's helpful. Uh, Jessica. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering as the citizen of Bloomington are aging, I don't see plans for creating senior housing that has a nice view on a river. I mean, to me, looking like the, the map that you provide look like a, where the Hyatt Hotel will be a good place for a senior mm -hmm. housing. I, it, I think we own to the city. I've been living in Bloomington for 25 years already, and I'm hoping to continue living here until my you know ages. But I don't see any open space in Bloomington to develop any senior housing. Is there something on the plans? Yeah, so we just put up the map for residential projects in the pipeline, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through in the lower uh, left-hand corner, Founders Ridge Senior, in the upper left-hand corner, Friendship Village Senior, Point Senior, Cherrywood Point Senior Assisted, uh, let's see here, Hayden Grove Senior, Opus Senior, um, Knox Landing. Yeah, Knox Landing. So there's quite a few that are in the pipeline currently for construction. And I'd say that, generally speaking, the senior market is still very strong in the Twin Cities mm -hmm. um, and probably will continue to be for a few more years because the baby boomers are the largest generation mm -hmm. who are now becoming um, um, mm -hmm. residents of those projects. So um, I think we'll probably start to see um, that level out a bit, but it's very strong right now in, in Bloomington. Thank you. Okay, we're, thanks. we're at time on this. Oh, we're on the time on this one. I just wanted to have a final call. John, go ahead. Yeah, and this may be just too big a question and maybe an observation embedded in a question, but I thought this presentation was great, Heather, by the way. Um, and Jamie raised this question about maybe a, you know, a city economic development director. And as I was thinking about some of the things I think we're challenged with, I'm wondering if it's an economic evolution director because I, I feel like our economy is changing pretty dramatically that it'll change funding to local government, jobs, and what we need in infrastructure. So I don't know which it is, and maybe that's just semantics. But my question is, especially because you're interim and relatively new here, have we hit a time where perhaps the idea of a port authority and then a relatively independent HRA, and then a city um, community development department are almost overlapping in less efficient ways than perhaps if we were to say, okay, the city's been of its current nature for a while now. It, are those constructs dated now? I, I mean, I remember when the Port Authority was first established, and we, we kind of wanted to do it because there were some economic development tools that that enabled but those are 45-year-old laws at this point. That's not how it works. And I'm just wondering, have we hit the point where it's time to relook at that structure? And would we save money or generate more economic activity if we did it? Or is that too big a conversation to have? That is an enormous question. But thank you. Um, <laughs> I, 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 will, I mean, I'll be happy to give you my two cents worth. Um, I think that 
I think every city struggles with this issue of structure and how to achieve goals. And I agree with you that the current structure is really kind of um, dictated by the statutes that it created those special um, agencies like the HRA and the Port Authority. Um, there are other structures that are out there. Um, and one of the things that I know many cities and counties have talked about is an economic development authority structure, which would give broader powers, would um, create um, the ability to kind of combine some of the powers of those special agencies. Um, I think this group of people works really efficiently together generally to deliver services and to think strategically as a unit, but there's always room for improvement in that area in any, any agency structure. So, um, I think that, um, I think you could look at that and I think that would be a good long-term, um, goal for the city is to think differently about, um, as you said, economic evolution. I like that. That's uh, that's good. You should copyright that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd, I would throw my additional two cents in here uh, to say that you're right, John, about the, the tools going back 45 years and how we decided to utilize the, the various statutory permissions. Um, the Port Authority is actually the most fulsome development authority that exists in statute. Um, uh, and so... The, at the time that it was created, um, the decision was made to focus it on the South Loop area, um, but it doesn't have to stay that way. The EDA um, approach, the Economic Development Authority approach, would actually provide a little bit more um, uh, flexibility than what the HRA has. So if we were looking at doing something, it might be um, that approach. But the other, for, the, for, for specific concern to the committee, though, is the taxing authority that each of those um, entities have. Because they're statutory creatures, the Housing and Redevelopment Authority has a levy each year, uh, and uh, historically Bloomington has levied at the maximum amount allowed for HRA uh, to fund our housing and redevelopment activity through that um, uh, group. Our Port Authority also has um, levy authority, and it has, I think, a, uh, a very similar um, cap in terms of the maximum amount that the Port Authority can levy for its activity. And in Bloomington, they have never turned on the Port Authority levy because the activity, the development activity that's been occurring within the areas um, organized by the Port Authority uh, have been able to generate revenue to sustain the, the at least the staff and um, associated cost to do that work. That, you know, that's uh, a conversation that we have also had at a staff and, and uh, somewhat at a council level of, about uh, the future and whether it makes sense to turn on a Port Authority levy, but I'm having a hard time imagining that that's going to be something we'll think about in the next couple of years as we're looking at, you know, uh, how do we manage our levy. So. One other um, <clears throat> thing that I want to point out that hasn't, I, I think hasn't been adequately brought out here is that the, <clears throat> the actual staffing model for the HRA and the Port Authority is that they're staffed by city employees on contract to the other entities. Um, and so if you, if, and ultimately it's the city council that really controls what activities the port and the, and the HRA do. So um, the benefit of that structure is that you have very little kind of duplicative kind of organizational infrastructure that goes on because they leverage all of the systems that the city have, that the city has to do things. And so probably arguably the marginal cost is like organizational things like audit and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, if you, if you said, if there was a, if you asked the question, is there a more efficient way to do it? It's hard for me at least to picture if you're going to have those activities going on, the model that the city has, I think does a pretty good job of doing it as efficiently as if they were all rolled in there. Um, and then getting the statutory benefits of the, like the iso the financial isolation, for example, that the Port Authority creates, um, which is a useful tool for the city. Um, so any other questions on this one? I know we're kind of eating a little bit into the community services department time. Um, not seeing anything else. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Uh, next up is the community services department.
about right in the middle to your right there, Diane. If you want to sit behind your name tag anyways. There. Good evening, members of the Community Budget Advisory Committee. All right, thank you. My name is Diane Kirby. I'm the director of the Community Services Department for the city. And tonight I'm going to provide you with an overview of the department. And I want to start with just talking a little bit about how we see our purpose here at the city. Uh, we really feel like we engage community and change lives here at the city. This is an overview of our services, kind of a high-level overview. Uh, we have uh, administration, which is a very small part of the department that provides the oversight for the department. Our community outreach and engagement division, which is about a year and a half old, that does our engagement with the community. We've got our public health division that's been protecting and promoting health in Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield for more than 40 years. We've got our communications division, which does promotion and education and uh, marketing around the community, and then support services, part of our communications division, which actually provides internal service to, uh, throughout our uh, print shop and mail room and uh, info desk. This is just a real quick overview of our budget requests for 2021. And basically what we're looking for in terms of property tax support in 2021 is $345,000 for community services administration. Uh, we're looking for about $1 million in the community outreach and engagement division. And then uh, public health, we're looking for uh, $1.3 million in property tax support. But I've got to point out there that only accounts for around 29% of the total budget. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of pretty diverse funding source that comes into the public health division, and I'll be describing more of that in a minute. So our total ask for the community services department is $2.8 million in property tax support in the general fund. The other division in community services is the communications division, which is actually part of a special revenue fund. It receives the bulk of its funding through franchise fees from the cable television company. Uh, we're looking for $250,000 in property tax support in 2021 for that division. This is a long-term model of the communications division, and um, we expect to drop below the working capital goal for the communications division in 2020, but then start to rebound around 2024. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> two years ago this week, actually two years ago tomorrow, we submitted the final reports to the City Council of a year-long, in-depth review of our public health and our human services divisions. There were a couple of recommendations that came out of that report that today we are seeing are bearing fruit. Um, first, there was the recommendation to transform the former Human Services Division into the new Community Outreach and Engagement Division. And the purpose of that was for the city to engage in sustained outreach and engagement efforts to build ongoing relationships with residents, organizations, and businesses with a special emphasis on those populations that were underserved or underrepresented in our community. That was in order to ensure that those populations were considered, that they were accounted for, and that they were heard in the development and delivery of city programs and services. Another recommendation that came out of that re those reports was about the public health division, that we do more to focus on reaching all eligible residents who need public health services, and that we should do more to tell the public health story and market its services more broadly. It was all about more visibility. Today, the role and the value of public health, I don't think has ever been more visible than it is, than it has been in the past six months. And it's certainly a pandemic can make the invisible visible. So I'll be sharing more about public health's role in COVID-19, as well as the broader efforts across the Community Services Department later in my presentation and how we, this really 
position the department really well to meet the response to COVID-19 in Bloomington. So let's take a look at the various divisions within the department. First of all, Community Services Administration. This is a very small, small area of uh, community services. is basically myself and an admin uh, assistant. Um, basically, this part of it uh, oversees the general administration of the department's divisions and staff development. Uh, I also coordinate a number of surveys for the city, both internally and externally, including the National Citizen Survey, which is underway right now, by the way. This is an annual scientific random sample survey of Bloomington residents that we have been conducting every year since 2012. We're also launching a citywide survey of Bloomington businesses next month. In addition, I'm involved in some of the city's organizational development efforts, and they include administering the Insights Discovery Tool for individual and team development. Now moving on to the communications division. Overall goal is really to market to the community, the city services, to build those relationships, inform and educate our community. The division carries out its goals through a variety of communication tools to help get the word out about all aspects of city operations, council decisions, new projects and initiatives, public safety information and more. And these tools include print communications, such as the city newsletter, The Briefing, our internal newsletter insider, the annual corporate report to the community, as well as social media tools, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Nextdoor, and YouTube. The division is also responsible for all aspects of video production, in addition to providing live and taped public meetings via streaming and cable television. User numbers here show the individual reach of the major tools that we're using. Every day, we are pushing out messages and videos to more than 12,000 Facebook users, over 22,000 Nextdoor users, and more than 6,000 Twitter followers. And each week, thousands of emails go out via e-subscribe to those who subscribe to specific topics they want more information about. And every month, we print and deliver 43,000 Bloomington Briefing newsletters to the community. This reach shows only the city's main accounts, Thousands more are reached through our auxiliary accounts in the police department, fire department, parks and recreation, and more. Mm. Bloomington's digital engagement has had tremendous growth over the last four and a half years. Our social media sites have each more than doubled since 2016. Facebook is up from around 3,300 followers in 2016 to more than 12,000 now. Twitter followers up 2,700 to more than 6,000. And the number of e-subscribe users has almost doubled in the same period, too. Also, note the dramatic increase in website traffic. That's the heavy blue line on the chart. That's more than doubled since 2016. This was actually a surprise to their staff when they saw this data because they considered the city's website to be a, a mature medium even back in 2016. And one more thing to note. The light blue area at the right end shows the data from the first six months of 2020. You can see that the trend lines for Facebook, Twitter, and the website have gotten noticeably steeper this year, an indication of their increased value as the events of 2020 have unfolded. We did some calculations to try to answer the question, how many messages did we deliver in 2019? And the numbers added up pretty fast. When you account for each print article, each video, each social media post, and each e-subscribe email, we found that we had delivered more than 26 million messages in 2019 through the city's main channels alone. When taking a closer look at engagement from Facebook, Nextdoor, and YouTube, we saw more than 18,000 likes on Facebook in 2019, and it should be noted that video is the number one way to engage with posts, and it's likely the reason we saw so much engagement on Facebook. On YouTube, there were more than 400,000 total views of city-produced videos posted to the site. And why is this engagement so important? Well, it lets us be part of the conversation, and it helps to get the city's messages out. On social media, you are rewarded when you create engaging posts, and the more shares, likes, and comments you receive, the greater your reach. But it's more than just about the numbers. It's also about the feedback that we receive, the words of praise or thanks that we get from residents. These are just some of the many comments that we've received from residents who feel that the briefing is a great source of news and how they appreciate being informed and staying connected. 
These two videos produced pre-COVID-19 last year are great examples of helping to carry out the Council's strategic priorities of high quality service and community image. I want to point out in particular the video on the bottom half. Its intended purpose was to promote the annual Public Works Open House in 2019. If you didn't see it, it was actually a spoof of the song by Queen Bohemian Rhapsody. The video reached more than 22,000 people and was viewed more than 13,000 times. And in the end, the Public Works Open House had a record turnout. 300 people more than the people they had expected, around 850 people total showing up for that open house. So very successful. Even in 2020, the Communications Division continues to develop fresh content, producing as many or more videos and online content as ever before, as well as providing more news and resource information to the community during the pandemic, announcing the important service changes or facility closures and openings, and highlighting residents or community partners, and spreading the work about their services and good work. And the Communications Division isn't taking a break during the pandemic. It just keeps adding tools to its toolbox. Council Minute features Mayor Tim Bussey summarizing recent council meetings and activities. And one of Mayor Bussey's goals coming into office was to enhance transparency in the city. So his Council Minute video update began back on March 2nd with 350 total views. Pretty good. But just two weeks later, Mayor Bussey provided the first of his updates on COVID-19. Viewership soared by 10 times over that first Council Minute. And Council Minute has really proven invaluable for keeping our audiences informed about the Council's and City's response to the pandemic and other timely topics. Also in 2020, the staff quickly adjusted to how we deliver important public meetings in a safe manner via video meetings. We started streaming City Council meetings live on YouTube and have a combined 4,200 views on the 16 meetings we've covered since April 6th. This is in addition, in addition to anyone watching on our cable TV channel as well as our website. <clears throat> Communications has also been streaming, as you know, the Community Budget Advisory Committee meetings and Planning Commission meetings so that our audiences can stay informed. We do have some budget challenges coming up for the Communications Division in 2021. Uh, with a vote last fall, the FCC allowed cable companies to assign a market value to the in-kind services that were negotiated in the franchise agreement with cities. Uh, the order could mean a reduction in the fees that the cable company is paying to the city. Uh, this was arguably one of the most consequential cable franchise rulings coming out of the FCC in the last 20 years. And cities, including Bloomington, have filed appeals. A briefing is expected to take place now through uh, the end of October with oral arguments not likely until 2021. Also, cable customers continue to cut the cord, which is a budget concern for us because franchise fees are a key source of funding for the communications division. So let's look at the communications division. Now we're gonna take a look at the community outreach and engagement division. We also know it as co-ed. Launched in January 2019, this team is focused on providing opportunities for community members to become involved in their local government. This involvement takes a variety of forms from volunteering or attending a community input session to serving on a committee such as CBAC. These opportunities influence greatness by providing a platform for residents to use and grow their own leadership skills. I wanted to show this to you because this is COED's work plan at the beginning of 2020. And I want to point out that many of COED's planned activities this year involved in-person engagement, face-to-face, -face, in the same room, community interaction. Well, that in-person engagement came to a screeching halt in March of this year due to COVID-19. But the division has become very inventive and very creative about how to engage the community when in-person interaction is impossible. And I'll talk about a few of those ways. COED's specific business focus and objectives support the city's council's strategic priorities, and they take place across departments. In the area of community image, the, depart the division hosts events and activities designed to provide an opportunity for the community to connect with one another. This is an image of Food for Thought, which in 2019 brought the City Council and Sustainability Commission together at a farmer's market to talk to residents about sustainability actions. 
Under the area of equity and inclusion, the Bloomington Leadership Program is designed to provide an opportunity for community members to learn about their local government, how to get involved, to serve on boards and commissions, and to develop their personal leadership skills. And Pathways to Local Government provides experiential learning opportunities for students that focuses on careers in local governments. Now, both of these programs had to be canceled in 2020 because of COVID-19. However, participants in past Bloomington Leadership Program classes have gone on to apply for positions on city boards and commissions, and I see a few of the Bloomington Leadership Program members in this audience today. There's also an alumni group of Leadership Program alumni that continue to meet virtually. In the area of focus renewal, Co-ed coordinators have provided advice and support on the Lindale Avenue Suburban Retrofit Strategy, and this includes creating an engagement plan. Coordinators also help to facilitate and support the Bloomington Housing Action Team. In the area of high-quality service delivery, there's a, a, a lot of work that's being done right now on a brand new program just launching called Let's Talk Bloomington. I know that you will be using this digital engagement platform to engage the community within the next month. Just did training with staff across the city on this, on this new platform, and this, I think, will be a key way for us to try to engage with residents in the coming months and, and uh, years ahead. Under the area of community amenities, staff have been supporting parks and recreation engagement process for the Parks Master Plan and also for Old Cedar Bridge Avenue celebration. Co-ed also provides support to the Human Rights Commission, which despite COVID-19, the commission has been able to complete several work plan initiatives this year with support from Co-ed. And these include the National Day of Racial he Healing earlier this year, the installation of gender neutral bathroom signage in city facilities and several city council proclamations. So that's a look at our community outreach and engagement division. And now we move on to our public health division. The Public Health Division provides health services across the three cities of Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield. This tri-city relationship has been in place for more than 40 years. The division is committed to promoting, protecting, and improving the health of all with a focus on reducing disparities and advancing health equity. The revenue for the Public Health Division comes from a variety of sources, a mix of federal, state, and local grants, fees for service, contracts with Edina and Richfield, and property taxes. Public health shines in a number of areas. These are just a few. Our WIC clients have some of the highest breastfeeding rates in the state. We also have really successfully been able to transfer to uh, our uh, virtual visits in both our WIC and our family home visiting programs. We've done a lot of work that has led the state in terms of tobacco policy and our COVID-19 response I will talk about more in a minute. Public health provides services in five key program areas and these services are a mix of direct service to individual clients and families as well as policy systems change and public education efforts that address health issues more on a community level. The division serves everyone in the community, but the emphasis is really on those vulnerable populations. These include immigrants, immigrants and refugees, individuals from our black, indigenous, and people of color communities, and people with few resources. Last year, public health served 20,000 clients in Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield. And these clients were primarily young children, new parents, and older adults. They were also disproportionately people from our BIPOC communities. For example, 86% of the Bloomington clients in our Women, Infant, and Children's program last year were members of the BIPOC community, and that's almost the mirror opposite of Bloomington's population, in which 80% of our residents identified as white in the 2010 census. Right now, as you can imagine, the area that is demanding much of public health's time, attention, and resources is the response to COVID-19. Their work is ranging from contact tracing to public education to connecting people to resources to community testing clinics. And public health is the lead agency in Bloomington in our efforts to respond to this rapidly evolving situation. I'll be sharing more about these efforts and their impact at the end of my presentation. In the area of administration, Speaking of impact, these are just some of the results of public health's work in the communities of Edina, Bloomington, and Richfield. 
the Public Health Administration does a lot of data collection and analysis, such as our Community Health Survey, in which drew more than 2,000 responses. One of the findings from that survey was that non-white respondents had higher percentages of binge drinking, diabetes, food insecurity, and smoking. And these, this is data that really informs our health promotion efforts. We've also done a lot of outreach to families with recent births to provide support and resources as needed. In the area of clinic services, public health receives and dispenses vaccines from the Minnesota Vaccines for Children program and the uninsured and underinsured adult vaccines program. One of our big programs at public health is our WIC program, which provides nutrition education and benefits to pregnant, postpartum, and breastfeeding women and, and children up to five years of age. In our WIC program, we've got breastfeeding peer counselors that are funded through a grant that provides support to our WIC clients. I mentioned this before, but we've got exceedingly high rates of breastfeeding and continued breastfeeding in our WIC program, and it's because of this breastfeeding peer counselor support. In the area of family health, the focus here is on maternal child health and vulnerable seniors. We do family home nursing visits with public health nurses. We've got many families that these nurses visit that are at risk for having poor childhood outcomes because of histories of trauma, mental or chemical health issues, or lack of support systems. For example, one of the things staff look for is postpartum depression, and referrals are made to mental health providers if they find that this is a concern. Senior health and well-being, staff follow up on referrals by neighbors, police, and others to help seniors and vulnerable adults stay safe in their homes. And in the area of health promotion, this is really work around policy systems and environmental work. It's creating the environments that provide healthy choices for the community. So the goal is to reduce health risks such as obesity, tobacco use, and unhealthy use of alcohol, and boost healthy behaviors. In this area of building relationships, we've got a program, a new program, still in its early stages. It's an effort that started at the Southgate Apartments and now working on supporting renters across Bloomington. And it's called a, it's a collective impact model, which really brings together partners from inside the city organization, as well as community partners to address specific social problems that renters are facing. One of the recommendations coming out of the public health service assessment was that public health needed to do a better job of focusing on its impact. So specific measurements of outcomes in public health had not been well articulated in the past. Public health has since developed performance metrics that you see here for short-term and long-term outcomes. This performance management dashboard was a direct result of that recommendation from the service assessment. These are some of the areas that will be given special focus in 2021. Public health will continue to be the lead agency for the city's COVID-19 response efforts. Hopefully, their focus will be shifting in 2021 to distributing vaccine when that becomes available. In the area of racial equity, the public health management team has prioritized initiatives in this area, identifying two initial focus areas, implementing an internal workforce development plan and health and all policies across city organizations. And then under the category of data needs, we really need to improve the ways in which we collect and analyze data in public health and across the city, and that will help inform our racial equity work. Right now, that's an important goal. We talked with that about that with the city council just Monday night, but something we want to do is improve our data infrastructure here at the city. In the area of budget challenges for 2021, these are some of the challenges that we see in addition to the items here. We're cognizant of ongoing challenges, such as a competitive labor market, especially when it comes to public health nurses. Also, the nature of public health is evolving, and we need to be able to adapt to meet the needs of the communities that we serve. But adapting services could have budget implications. So that's a look at the three divisions of the Community Services Department. And now a word about COVID-19 and its impact on the department in 2020. Community services has been on the front lines of the response to this pandemic from day one. As I noted earlier in my presentation, the service assessments of public health and human services back in 2018 really positioned this department well to rise to the challenge of responding to this pandemic in our community. 
We were able to pivot our work across the department and rapidly, efficiently, and collaboratively educate and engage our community and respond to the crisis. This is the first incident command structure for the COVID-19 response team from March. The staff in the red boxes are members of the community services department, and we've grown from this on the response team to this. Here's the current organizational chart for incident command team. The response team spans across much of public health as well as deep into our communications and community outreach and engagement divisions. By working collaboratively in frequent and close communication, we are ensuring that Bloomington gets the best response possible on the local level to the pandemic. These are the response objectives for the incident command team. Key among this is just providing accurate, timely, and educational communication to both our city leaders, school district leaders, our community partners, as well as to our residents across the community. We've been sharing this COVID dashboard uh, on our website and uh, started sharing it back in June. And it presents basically pure data about what's going on with COVID-19 in our community. Really helps to keep our residents informed. And we feel like it's been a forum where we've been able to provide answers that are crafted by our public health experts. Our co-ed team has been serving as the outreach team as part of the city's incident command structure. Their outreach plan includes developing networks and key contacts within these groups to reach target populations which have been identified as being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And they include older adults, our BIPOC communities, our people with disabilities, low-income individuals and families, and small businesses. The outreach team communicates via each email each week to share the latest information and messages related to COVID-19 to these groups. In addition, other information including resources on rental assistance, food resources, grant opportunities, and more are also provided. And several of the groups are also hosting virtual meetings with the outreach team where staff can provide updates and also bring in content experts to answer their questions. This team also coordinates translation of messages into Bloomington's most commonly spoken languages of Spanish, Somali, and Vietnamese. And in addition, we've been purchasing radio ads on three radio stations to reach the Latinx, African American, and East African communities. We've got several success stories already. Staff have been working hand in hand across the department to produce social media posts to share important messages related to COVID-19. Many of our messages have featured public health staff from our contact tracers to language interpreters, public health nurses, um, resource line operators, just to name a few. In addition, we've been able to share regular video and post updates produced by MDH and the governor's office, providing access to accurate and essential information from these trusted resources. And we've been sharing important information from MDH and the CDC with a local point of view, like this Mask Up Bloomington Instagram series. This is a playful series of photos showing Bloomington landmarks and equipment with masks added via Photoshop. These have received great engagement on Instagram with positive comments and hundreds of likes and loves and have helped to highlight the mask messaging that we want to get out there into the community. And we've actually been noticed by several other Minnesota agencies who've expressed an intent to follow our lead by making their own similar images for their audiences. <laughs> so we still have a lot more to do on COVID-19 going into 2021. Um, we are planning community testing events. We've actually got one coming up. We're partnering with the Minnesota Department of Health and the State Emergency Operations Center on a community testing event on September 1st at Kennedy High School. More information to come on that one. We're also providing consultation to the three school districts in our areas on their return to school plans. And we're collaborating with the University of Minnesota and local public health partners to develop a survey to assess the community impact of COVID-19 over time. We also anticipate that a future objective will be focused on dedicating resources to planning and operationalizing the mass dispensing of vaccine. So this has been truly a department-wide response effort related to COVID-19. And as I said, I believe those health, uh, the service assessments that we did 2018 really did position us to respond to the pandemic. So that's just a quick look at the Community Services Department, and I will stand for questions. Thank you, Diane. Questions from folks? 
uh, it would be Neil and then Sa. Diane, you are, you are always so articulate. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, again, how do you get the numbers? I was looking at the report of the confirmed cases and the ICUs. Do, do doctor clinics like, call in and tell you, or do you find them? How do you so, confirm those numbers? Actually, that's all being coordinated through the state, so we were able to get that okay. data through the state. And they are reporting out numbers as well. We are able to get that information specifically for Bloomington. I see. And that, that actually is back-end database. It's communicating on the back-end directly with the state. Because they know and where It's updating the, automatically, yeah. They know where the resident lives or reports. They're getting those reports. Oh, okay. correct. So, this is Chair. Thank you, Diane, for that. Um, can you explain to me how the funding is split between the three cities for the um, public health uh, between Edina and Richfield and Bloomington? Yes, you know, and as a matter of fact, I'm glad you asked that question because um, we actually, as part of the service assessment, did do a closer look at how the money is split. So there's actually, and, and actually have made some changes as a result of that service assessment. But basically, um, within the last two years, we did a study of ba the services. So it's, it's a real, very complicated formula that includes the services that we're providing to those communities, the, the number of clients that we have in those communities, the type of services, um, the um, direct expense to those communities. So um, there's uh, like six different ways that we're actually allocating out the funding and then also uh, then uh, contracting with those two cities as well. So there's a, it's a very fairly complicated funding formula that we've come up with that we think does try to more accurately get at just the cost of services sure. to all those communities. So then do you see that Bloomington, I guess where does Bloomington lie within the three cities? Are, are we offering more? Do we have more clients utilizing our, our services compared to Richfield and Edina? So certainly Bloomington is a larger community compared to Edina and Richfield. So certainly um, we do have more services that we're providing, more, more demand for our services from Bloomington. Um, and, and then I would say in Richfield and Edina, it kind of depends. A um, little bit, di both of those kind of different communities. We've got younger families in Richfield. We've got in uh, Edina, we've got an older population. So our services are tailored to meet their needs. Sure. Other questions? John Gibbs. I'm interested in the funding piece of this public health. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe in most of the other suburbs and cities in Hennepin County, Hennepin County is the public health department. Is that right or wrong? In, you are correct. Right. So I'm just wondering, do, do we get funding then from the county to fund this department and offload some of that work that they would normally do? We do not get funding from the county. We do from the state, but not from the county for our public health services. We have a community health services grant with the state that provides that funding. So it's property taxes and the state are the two big funding sources. So do you know, do we pay property tax, I mean, our county property taxes, are, are we funding the county's public health department? Mm -hmm. So uh, co-chairs, uh, John, committee members, uh, we've been looking at this pretty closely over the last, actually going back to when we did the assessment. Uh, it's about a third of our public health budget is um, taxpayer supported. And then the rest comes in through the revenue sources through the state and the federal government, the grant programs. Bloomington residents do pay through their county property taxes for county public health services. Uh, however, there's very little overlap um, of the public health service provision in Bloomington uh, and what we do through our own public health division. So this has been a little bit of a rub, um, recognizing that our uh, taxpayers are paying twice for public health services. Uh, and we've been looking at that, uh, trying to understand if there's some recourse for our taxpayers. And I think that you'll probably see something about that in our legislative platform for next year. It just seems to me in that business of other people's money or our money <laughs> spending other places, there, it, it just seems intuitive to me there must be significant opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Other questions? 
seen any hands waving up and down. So thanks, Dan, for coming tonight. You're very welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, at the end of the meeting, we just kind of round the room. Any reflections on what we saw tonight? Any thoughts, closing thoughts before we're done? John. Uh, Jamie, I, uh, I understand we had a, you had your first meeting and I'm trying to think of uh, the community that you met with. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Committee members, we had our first community engagement session yesterday afternoon with the Latinx community leaders. Uh, that's a, a group that's been meeting regularly with our outreach and engagement team. Uh, and they were kind enough to dedicate most of their agenda yesterday to um, participating with us. Uh, it was a really good learning opportunity. Co-Chair Steve Peterson uh, kicked it off for us and, and uh, framed the work that the committee's doing and what's been asked by the council. And uh, it was good for us, uh, maybe not so good for the Latinx community leaders, um, because we really uh, discovered that the amount of information we have in there was probably too detailed, maybe a little too granular, and needed to be on a little bit of a higher plane. Um, we still had a very good conversation with them. Uh, but our, you know, our information largely focused on the, the, the challenge for the budget next year and then the, you know, the tax levy issues. And so the reaction was largely focused around concern um, about the burden of property taxes increasing, especially on in communities that um, you know, may have limited economic means. Um, but they did give us a, a lot of really good input and um, helped us because we're going to be doing these same presentations, so we'll refine the presentations going forward. How many people were involved? I think they had eight, six or eight um, uh, people. They've had anywhere from five to 15 people on their regular calls, so it was about right in the middle of what they usually experience. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And uh, Steve, did you want to offer anything more from your perspective or Carl? No, I think that... I think that reflects it from what I saw. I, I can add one thing is they translated all of our questions that we asked, the discussion questions from yesterday, into Spanish and are going to be sharing them with the members that were not able to attend. And they're going to collect that feedback as well. Do you have other comments? Anything else? Jamie, any final observations from you? or? Uh, no, just to, uh, again, reiterate what I said early in the meeting about uh, giving the targets to staff. Um, w one of the things that we're, we're looking at right now is the schedule going forward, and I think uh, we're going to uh, ask the committee to alter the uh, schedule and not have the meeting on September 9th. Um, the amount of uh, the, the turnaround time for our departments to put together their um, options for reductions is pretty tight. And so I wanted to give them an extra week. Uh, and um, we're going to figure out what we do then on the meetings on the 16th and the 23rd. But uh, I'm, I'm expecting nobody to be opposed to taking a Wednesday off. And so uh, if it's okay with you, we're going to use that, that September 9th date to give the department directors a little bit more time to prepare. I'm seeing John wanting to come to the meeting over there. But <laughs> I've heard protest. I can, <laughs> being vague about which John. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've so got I think, it on my calendar, John, so I'm more than willing to have a social get together <laughs> if you're getting some interactions. So. Well, I hope you two have a good time. <laughs> okay. Anything else, Jamie? Anything else from you, Jamie? No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, unless there's anything else, we are done for tonight. Thanks. So we are adjourned. <laughs>